Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the Gig Harbor City Council meeting Monday, April 26, 2021. Uh, the time is 5.30. Due to the public health concerns, this meeting will be accessible by phone by dialing the numbers that we've listed on our website and entering your meeting ID number that's been provided or by Zooming through the information we've also put on our city's website. Comments are only allowed during the designated portions of this meeting. To speak during this meeting, press the raise hand button near the bottom of your Zoom window or press star nine on your phone. Please refrain from raising your hand until the mayor has announced that he has opened up the public comment portion of the meeting. When your name or your last four digits of your phone number uh, will be called out, it is your turn to speak. When using your phone to call in, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. All speakers have up to three minutes to speak. And they've also been able to uh, give public comment, which has to be read under three minutes, which uh, goes to the city clerk's office prior to 3 p.m. Uh, with that, I'd like to call our meeting, uh, call, do a roll call. Please say here after, after I announce your name, Councilmember Aversol. Here. Councilmember Jensen. Here. Councilmember Franich. I think he's in attendees. Okay. Is there a way to, let's see. Oh, here he is. I will let you work with that and um, I'll just. Here. Great. Councilmember Himes. Uh, one more time, Councilmember Hines. We may be having an audio problem with that. Um, Councilmember Hines, where to go? He looks frozen. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, who wants to call? <laughs> Not me. I'm trying to. I'll call. Josh, Josh, could you give him a call? Yeah, I'll get a hold of him. Okay. Uh, Council Member Markley. Here. Council Member Rodenberg. Here. Council Member Wook. Here. Thank you. And this is Mayor Kit Kuhn. And we went from staff. We have City Administrator Bob Larson. Here. Community Development Director Katrina Knutson. Here. Chief Kelly Busey. I'm here. Great. Public Works Director Jeff Langhelm. Here. Finance Director David Rodenbach. Here. Building Official Fire Marshal Paul Rice. Here. Our Tourism Communication Director Laura Pettit. I see you. Okay. Are you here, Laura? Yes, she checked the box. She's here. <laughs> City Clerk, uh, Molly Townsley. Here. And you don't know anything about that, Lindsay, do you? <laughs> Assistant City Clerk, Open Government Administrator, Josh Decker. Here. Okay. With our, our City Attorney, Daniel Kinney. Here. Great. We have some guests tonight. Uh, Lindsay Stouffer. There she is from Har Harbor Wild Watch. Uh, Sharon Bishop. Good to see you and Monica Vellis from the Gig Harbor Boat Shop as well. Thank you. Um, let's see, I don't think I've missed anyone. Is there anyone uh, from staff that I have missed? Please say so now. I think I got all 20. So, and then we're waiting for Councilmember Himes. Did you have any luck? Josh? He's coming on right now. Okay. We'll wait just one moment. I am here. All right. That's great. Everyone's nice sunny day and everyone showed up. That's great. Okay. With that, uh, I'd like to join us in a moment of silence for the Pledge of Allegiance.
because keep forgetting I don't have to turn around and look at the flag behind me. There's one right there on the screen. I'll thank you for those. Uh, changes to the agenda. Uh, a couple, a couple things, Ginny. I know you were wanting to. I know you had mentioned having um, having the fireworks old business one in front of staff report. We still may do that if you want, but we're going to keep the staff report to ten minutes because we have um, we have a work study session Thursday to go over the same stuff that we're doing under the report. This is just a report. So if that's okay with you, that we keep it under 10 minutes because we're going to be talking about that Thursday. Uh, are you okay with that? I would still like to move it up to before a staff report, please. Okay, the one thing is we're going to have a variety, we're, we're going to have probably five or six staff members that have to wait through all of the fireworks just because of that 10 minutes. So you give the chance of some staff being allowed to leave. And considering the fireworks is gonna take a, a long time. And if we keep the staff report under 10 minutes, then you're not expecting them to stay throughout that whole time. Just asking you one more time. You, you wanna make them stay for all that? Thank you. I'd like to have, I'd like to move the fire report up to uh, before the staff report. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, staff. I tried. So, um, okay. And I think there was another hand raised, Councilmember Rodenberg. Yes, I'd like to have uh, consent agenda number three, uh, the resolution 1206, the lodging tax grants. I'd like to have that taken out of the consent agenda and move to under new business for separate uh, discussion and vote. Okay, all right. We'll do that right after the consent agenda, uh, which is usually what we do if we move something off. So great. And <clears throat> Mayor, just uh, the council rules of procedure would require a vote for a majority vote of council to amend this, the agenda. So you could lump those two together or do that independently. All the right. con the con consent agenda pull is kind of normal routine to pull it off. So I don't think that would need a vote. Um, but the rules of procedure do require a vote for the new business to get moved. Okay, so then we're going to have a vote on polling um, uh, old business number one in front of staff report. Um, is there a motion to do that? So I move to pull to put uh, old business number one and before the staff report. Is there a second? Okay. We'll stay with the staff report first. And uh, so we are moving resolution 12, 1206 off the consent agenda. With that, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve. Okay, that was by Councilmember Markley. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Councilmember Aversold. All those in favor say aye. 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 Consent agenda passes seven to zero. And our presentation tonight is, I'm sorry, our, our first one is a res, our item that we pulled is resolution 1206, which is lodging tax grants. Um, it, you know, it, it, go ahead, Council Member Rodenberg. Yes, I would. Uh, since I am the president of the Geek Harbor Sportsman's Club, and it is one of the recipients of the grant, I'd like to recuse myself from that vote. Okay, thank you. So uh, is there a motion to approve uh, Resolution 1206 Lodging Tank Tax Grants? Council Member Franich. Well, I, I have a qu some questions, so I don't I'm not plan on making the motion. Okay. I'll make the motion to approve uh, resolution 1206. Second. Second by Council Member Markley. Okay, there is uh, in the in the clarifying questions for staff first. Go ahead, Council Member Franich. Thank you. I, uh, 
I'm kind of glad uh, Council Member Rodenberg pulled this off. I wasn't really going to say anything, but since it's pulled off and we have a chance to discuss this, um, I didn't get a chance to go back and listen to the lodging tax um, meeting tape, but um, can somebody explain? It just seems a little odd that um, we are using lodging tax funds for tree planting at the Sportsman's Club. Um, is there anybody there that can explain that to me? Yes, uh, uh, Laura. Sure. Um, so the application was specifically for the restoration of the beauty of that area in that uh, the Sportsman's Club attracts tourism throughout the year. Um, and with the, uh, what is it called? The easement that was uh, sold to the city for the space for the roundabout, some trees were taken down. Some are replaced, but not all were. Um, and this is in line with um, maintenance and operation of a structure um, that is related to tourism. Well, it, it seems like it, that, that's uh, quite a stretch. Uh, I also, this the $8,000 for this Narrows Challenge event seems like a stretch for me as well. But not near the stretch that tree planting at the Sportsman Club uh, seems to be, but uh, I'll have to go back and listen to the tape and uh, see what the rationale was behind this, but. Uh, sure. uh, I would like to add one other thing too, that mitigates the sound and noise from the Sportsman's Club to the surrounding area uh, and, and mitigates some noise pollution there as well. And I know that was something that the, the Lodging Tax Committee responded to. Well, uh, it, that, that seems like a separate issue. The, the lodging tax is supposed to promote tourism within the city. I see you nodding your head up and down, but uh, so noise mitigation, I, I don't see the nexus there. Right. I think noise mitigation and beautification were the, um, the reasoning behind uh, that application specifically. Council Member Abersole. Yeah, so I guess maybe I got uh, two questions. Uh, are these trees going to be, these are, I'm assuming these are being planted somewhere near the street where the public uh, is visibly able to see them? And then I guess my second question is, is uh, for the Sportsman's Club, it, it's not open to the public, is it, it's for members only? Is I'm correct on that or am I incorrect on that? I will let uh, Council Member Rodenberg answer both those questions. I think the trees are up by the wall at the top of the hill, but go ahead, Councilman Rodenberg. Uh, the trees are planted at the top of that concrete block that's on Harbor Hill Road, uh, at the top of that. And yes, we're open to the general public. You can okay. be a member and we welcome the general public. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, we will open up the, yes, Council Member Markley. Thank you. I was just going to say in regards to the noise reduction, um, as a resident that lives near the Sportsman's Club, I appreciate these trees being planted. So thank you. Great. I will open up the public comment and then we'll go back to council comments. Um, count, uh, uh, Bob Larson, City Administrator, were there any public comments that were written on this? We did not receive any written comments for this item. Okay. I will see if there's anyone from the public that um, wishes to speak. I see one hand raised. Uh, uh, caller, uh, Linda, you've got three minutes. Please state your name and address. Go ahead. Um, my name is Linda Ader. I live on Purdy Drive. And um, I agree with the Councilman Frankel that this doesn't seem to be a, a good use of taxpayer money taxing the uh, lodging establishments to pay for trees somewhere else. Thank you. And I do have one other question. Why was the Pledge of Allegiance conducted in silence? Um, because So sometimes because everyone's at a different speed and everyone's at a different, we, we, we used to try it with people speaking and it seemed very disorganized. 
um, last meeting, we actually had some uh, Girl Scouts that actually did it for us. So we listened to them. And then actually the time before that, we actually had someone else. So we kind of, we actually kind of mix it up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ho soon, hopefully we'll get back to where we can all sing it together in person. Uh, that will, I'm gonna uh, close the public comment and get back to questions. I'm gonna come right back to Council Member Dinson before I had Council Member Franich had his hand up when I open up the public comments. So after that, I'll go to you. Council Member Franich. Yeah, I, uh, the, the tree planting mitigation um, that's gonna be taking place um, for the Harbor Hill Drive, the mitigation there, are those street trees? Um, well, I'll let Jeff answer that. I'm sorry, Mayor. I'm not aware of the species of trees that are being proposed. Maybe Councilmember Rodenberg would know. No, I'm talking about the trees for the mitigation of the installation of the road the, the, that we didn't get to the tree planting this year. I believe there's several hundred thousand dollars that's set aside for I'm sorry. No, that 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 tree planting is not uh, mitigation of the roadway project. That mitigation tree planting was already conducted. Um, the the money that was uh, that still remains in that fund to plant trees will be natives, but it has to do with uh, offsite impacts due to adjacent property on, on an adjacent property owner's property. But those are native species, evergreens. Thank you. Yes, Council Member Dinson. Yes, and this is a question for Ms. Pettit. Um, I'm sure you already do this, but I just wanted to make sure since this is kind of a relatively new program for LTAC funds, kind of meant to inspire and, and assist new events and new, new projects to come to the harbor. At the culmination of these events, uh, will LTAC or you do some sort of an analysis of whether it met the goals of LTAC, I think that's what Council Member Franich is concerned about. And, and I, I definitely hear that. Is this encouraging tourism? Did it bring people in? That might be instructive to us for the next round of, of these funds. Yes, and that's always been a part of this program is that reporting is required from each recipient on how many people were brought in, how many people stayed overnight, how many people attended. And that's one of the reasons we have our new geofencing software in place because it is hard uh, for something like this project to showcase, especially in a year like 2020 over 2021, I'm assuming everyone's going to have more tourism um, from 2021 to 2022. But we also wanna show that specifically more people are visiting the uh, Sportsman's Club as a result of this. Uh, and we'll be able to do that with a geofence that shows us exactly where they, where they stayed, if they stayed, if they came from out of town, what demographics they were in and so forth. Thank you. Councilman Robertson. Yeah, I, I, I can see this, um, you know, maybe not the best way to spend money out of LTAC, but I can see the Sportsman's Club as being a drawer for people coming from out of the community uh, to come to the, our area. I don't know how many other um, venues uh, in local communities are like that, uh, the Sportsman's Club giving people an opportunity to legally shoot their firearms safely in a, a positive manner. Uh, so I think it's it, it's appropriate. And also if we made an agreement that we took trees out and we said we were putting trees back, we need to honor that agreement. I do wanna say that we, we haven't made any, we have not made any agreement to take, we have not made, uh, we don't have to put any trees back from agreement that we made the city. We fulfilled ours, just so you know. Um, Council Member Franich. Yeah, Ms. Pettit, uh, is it possible that you could um, uh, please forward me uh, the list of the applications that were received? Um, Absolutely. Thank you. We did, we did award, everyone that applied was awarded some money. So if you look in your council packet, um, she can do, still do so, but all the names that are in there 
actually were all the applicants that we did get. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Laura, does it tell the, the amount they asked for? I haven't looked myself versus um, what they were awarded. Yeah, wait a minute, here it is. I can forward that separately. That is in a spreadsheet I have. Yeah, if you would send that to council, that'd be great. All council. Um, it does It does show what they were awarded, but it doesn't show what they asked. So council member for Anich will, will uh, send that to each uh, council member. And next time when we do this round, we should actually show what they asked, if we would, Laura. Great. Uh, council member Dinson. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick note that the Sportsman's Club not only has shooting opportunities and archery opportunities, but they do events throughout the year, including a big blues festival that is, I would say, a, a draw for tourists in the community. And I know they've got other fundraisers for permission to start dreaming foundation, but the blues in particular is a draw for people from outside of our community. So I just wanted to make that connection if, if folks weren't aware. Great. And I will let people know that they, they have to turn in their receipts. They're paid after they've spent the money, um, just to let applicants know that two. <laughs> okay, there's uh, been discussion, deliberation. Uh, we've got a motion. Oh, uh, Council know. Member Wook. No, sorry. Okay. okay. Um, we'll, we'll do a roll call. All those in favor say aye. Start with Council Member Wook. Aye. Council Member Jensen. Aye. Council Member Rodem. I'm sorry. He's excusing himself. Council Member Franich. No. Council Member Himes. No. Councilmember Markley. Aye. Councilmember Aversold. Aye. Okay, motion passes uh, four to two. Uh, just one moment, let's make note. Totally missing. Okay, well, thank you. With that, well, we have two presentations tonight. Uh, Harbor Wild Watch is their year end report. We are asking people not just to turn in their report but come talk to us and let us uh, hear from you. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Lindsay Stover. Wonderful, thank you so much for inviting me to come speak to you today. Um, it's nice to see uh, so many faces that I have not seen in a while. Um, I'm just gonna get my screen shared here with you. And can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so as Mayor Keene mentioned, um, my name is Lindsay Stover. I'm the executive director of Harbor Wild Watch, is your local environmental education organization. And um, I'm here to let you all know about what Harbor Wild Watch has been doing um, in the last year and really how we have continued to deliver environmental education programs in a pandemic. Uh, quick background for you, we were founded back in 2004 by a local resident. Our mission is to inspire stewardship for Puget Sound and the Greater Salish Sea. And we do that by providing a variety of public and student programs that uh, teach people about the local environment. And um, that includes the operation of the Sandy Visitor and Interpretive Center, which we graciously leased from the city of Gig Harbor. Um, and we've been there since 2014. Um, and in normal years, we pro provide uh, over a thousand hours of public programming out of the Scandi House. And uh, in 2019, we delivered over 600 educational programs uh, to over 35,000 people from our local community, as well as people visiting our area. And we do that with a staff of three, um, some wonderful board members, and over 60 incredible volunteers and divers that help us uh, do all of that. Like most businesses and organizations uh, in our area and across the world, our world turned upside down in March of 2020. Um, for us, everything came to a halt. Excuse me, uh, that was my laundry machine. <laughs> um, everything came to a halt when schools closed in March. Um, our staff, thankfully, is incredibly technologically savvy, and we quickly, within the first week, uh, began kind of planning what, how we were going to deliver quality environmental education programs when we were prevented from doing in-person programs. 
we immediately focused on what we felt was the most crucial community need, and that was really for students and parents. Students who had been taken out of their traditional educational systems and parents who were more involved than they ever had been before with guiding online learning and for some people homeschooling their kids for the first time. Um, so by the beginning of April, we actually transitioned the majority of our in-person programs to a digital format. And we were one of the first organizations in the region to do that. This is the platform that um, the platforms that we utilize primarily. We already had a, a pretty strong presence on Facebook. We quickly became familiar with Zoom and Microsoft Teams and, and Google Meet, the, the types of um, programs that we're using right now. Um, our, we posted all of our videos that we did on YouTube, so people who didn't have social media were still able, able to access our programs. And then we quickly became um, involved in TikTok, which was kind of a surprise out of the pandemic. Um, we had several videos that went viral um, when we discovered a, or not discovered, but um, found a very rare deep sea fish on one of our beach walks. And um, we were both on the local news, um, on all the different channels. And then we actually went viral on TikTok, which means we got over a million views from around the world. And it just launched our um, sort of TikTok phenomenon. And really, we took all the same quality programs that we've been delivering since 2004 and just put them in digital format. So instead of going into the classrooms, we started uh, Zooming and with, with our classrooms or students at home so that they could um, learn those STEM workshops. Instead of taking people and meeting them on the beach, the estuary, and the forest, and the wetland, we took them with us when our staff went to these um, different habitats. We started doing science workshops right out of the Scansi Visitor Interpretive Center instead of our Science Saturdays that we would bring people in um, each week during the summertime. And we continued our cocktails and fishtails presentations by regional experts and had people talking about everything from orca behavior to uh, tagging great white sharks. Um, and we did continue to do our community science biodiversity monitoring of our local habitats during this time. I have a 60 second video that I'm gonna play you just in case you haven't seen any of our programs. This gives you a little bit of a taste um, of the type of programs that uh, we are providing. Alrighty, hello there. We have some fabulous urchins here on this beach to talk about. There's the green urchin, which we're familiar with, familiar with out in the South Sound. This is an animal with the world's longest scientific name, Strongulocentroptus drobachiensis. Um, very, very cool animal. Uh, you can see its mouth in the center, called the Aristotle's Lantern. It's a five-part self-sharpening tooth set. That's perfect for chomping on delicious seaweed. So, green sea urchin. Also, in the Puget Sound, we have the red urchins and the purple urchins. And this is where these groups are actually easy to identify because the color is actually the color of the type of urchin. So, green, purple, and red. Alrighty. Um, and with all change, there was definitely a steep learning curve that we experienced. Everything from technical difficulties, not having great Wi-Fi in certain remote locations, to new equipment that we needed uh, because, you know, set the wind um, when you're live streaming uh, does not come across very well. So getting new um, microphones and things like that. We had budget challenges and some of our sources disappeared because we weren't having in-person programs anymore. And then we were also balancing community needs with our own staff hardships. You know, we were experiencing the same thing that everyone else was with childcare issues and, um, you know, dealing with um, parents or grandparents who were in that high risk population and trying to keep them safe. We had an absolutely incredible response from the community um, because I mentioned we're, you know, being digital expands um, our demographics. We had not only a local response, but regional, national, and worldwide. And um, I mentioned earlier that TikTok presence, because of that, and it's trickling down into all of our other platforms, we saw across 2020 a 60% increase in our followers on our social media platforms, which means that we're just getting out and sharing Gig Harbor and our incredible habitats with so many more people. In total, we delivered 233 programs across all those digital platforms in 2020. And that equated to 2.5 million minutes viewed 
which is pretty incredible when you really think about that number with um, three staff members um, who kind of, you know, just quickly moved into in a matter of weeks into this new format. And we're continuing to do this, um, you know, this year in 2021. Uh, we learned a lot in 2020 and we are, you know, fixing those mistakes and adjusting. Um, we're actually starting our beach season here um, coming up next month. And we're, our cocktails and fish sales presentation um, is a, a monthly occurrence. And then our K through 12 STEM workshops are happening by request by not only our Peninsula School District, but um, schools from around the South Puget Sound region. Um, so for more information and to, to see all of these events, you can visit our website calendar or you can go to our Facebook page where all of our events are listed. Um, or you can um, email us and get on our um, weekly email list. I encourage you to follow us if you are not already. Um, we, like I said, have so many videos coming out and you can really um, see what we've been doing. And then if you go to our YouTube page, you can see everything that we have done in, in the last year. Um, so that's all I have for you today. I'm so thankful for all of your support and the support of this community. Um, and I'm not sure if there's time, but I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Sure, are there any questions from council? <clears throat> what was that unknown fish that your nonprofit discovered? Yes, yeah, so uh, we came across, it's called the king of the salmon and it's a type of ribbon fish. And it is, um, the eyeball is about the size of a coffee cup and it is, was six feet long. And we came across it um, when we were on a beach in Port Angeles. And uh, we took video of it, we um, live streamed it, and then it was picked up by the news because our TikTok video went viral. Um, so we also, because of the, the TikTok um, uh, experience, we were just recently featured on Evening Magazine. Um, and so Gig Harbor got another, um, that was just earlier this month, um, got, got some more publicity. And that was really all stemming from that uh, discovery of that that ribbon fish. Good show, good show. Councilmember Aversol. I'm sorry, Councilmember Rodenberg. Yeah, I was going to ask Lindsay. Uh, you had three staff members. Are you all volunteers? Or are you paid staff? We are all paid full time staff members. Thank you. And then you use uh, non. You use a lot of volunteers as well. Correct. Um and. Uh, the problem is, is that um, in 2020, we really weren't utilizing volunteers because we could not gather. Um, and so, you know, our volunteers were following us online and, and doing all that, but um, we weren't able to utilize any volunteers in 2020. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you very much for that great presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. And then we have Ed and Boat Shop with uh, Sharon Bishop and Monica Vallis. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce myself as the new business manager at the Gig Harbor Boat Shop. And since I just recently joined, um, Monica Bellis is here with me, and she is our special projects coordinator. And uh, she was the one sole staff member on 2020. So she's got a lot of historical knowledge if uh, you have any questions for us. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have a uh, PowerPoint presentation. The annual report was already submitted in a PDF format, um, but I just wanted to walk through the document and just uh, call out uh, just a few key points and then we'll you know, be available to answer any questions for you. So as we all know, due to COVID last year, uh, we had to close to the public and pause in-person programming on March 13th. Um, you know, the Gig Harbor Boat Shop is a nonprofit community boat yard and a tourism facility However, given the majority of our programs involve hands-on activities in a small workspace environment, it just wasn't feasible for the boat shop to remain open uh, if we can't actually do any of these programs. However, prior to the closing uh, in Q1 in January and February, there were some programs that uh, generated some revenue, including the music at the boat shop. Uh, there were several skills workshops as well as the community boat restoration programs. Um, there was a decision made um, by the board and executive staff to conserve resources by reducing the staff to just one half time employee and that would be Monica. And um, the facility operations were supported by the board members and these committee volunteers 
um, that help to keep the business facility um, operational in terms of, you know, making sure the bills are paid, things like that, as well as advocate for the historic boatyard site completion, um, working with the city, including the railways and the brick house renovation. As we continue, um, so our volunteers also delivered some virtual programs and I'm going to hand this over to Monica because she really led the effort on a lot of these bullet points. Monica? Yeah, thank you Sharon. Um, so one of our virtual programs that we were pleased to be able to offer was Nautical Knot Tying. Um, one of our volunteers was able to um, create a short video series that just were quick tutorials on how to tie knots. Um, that included the square knot, um, the, let's see, the round turn, two half hitches, um, and the clove hitch. And we also have some additional um, knots that we plan to provide in the future as well. So that's a video series that we hope to continue. Um, and with those videos, we posted them on our YouTube channel, uh, I'm sure them on Facebook and Instagram, so, and via email. Um, and we had overall a really good response from the public. Um, we launched out at a time where people were at home, bored, looking for something to do. Um, so to give people the opportunity to still engage with us and learn um, a fun new skill that really anyone can pick up and learn um, was something that we were really pleased to offer. Um, in addition to that, we also converted our traditional in-person auction um, to our first ever online auction. Um, so that looked a little bit different because obviously we would have loved to gather in our space um, and do our traditional auction. Um, but obviously with COVID restrictions and for the safety of our visitors and staff, we went online and went virtual. Um, that also had a really positive response. So we will actually this year be continuing um, with our virtual auction yet again. Um, and that gave people the opportunity to bid on items um, make donations to the boat shop and really opened it up um, to anyone that had any sort of internet access. So they could be online on their cell phone, um, on their computer, on a tablet. Um, and traditionally that online auction is just held in one evening. Um, but with going virtual, we were able to expand that to a week long uh, event, which was really fun. Um, we also have continued to stay engaged with the community through social media. Um, so posting and also have converted our store um, to an online store. So we have a curated selection of boat shop apparel and items that people can purchase online. Um, and so that's been a unique way to, to be able to stay, um, have people virtually visit our store. Great, thank you, Monica. And as I mentioned earlier, given the hands-on nature of our, the majority of our programs, we had to uh, shut down the majority of them. Um, however, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna step forward and step back. We did uh, have a couple of programs. Uh, there was the community boat restoration programs, the music. There was also a name board carving that happened in February, the virtual auction, the knot tying series. And then Monica, you could probably also speak to the Santa's Boat Shop, the boat in the bag that we did yeah. in December. Definitely. Um, so Santa's Boat Shop is another program that we've offered um, for several years. And it's a program where children with their families can come into the boat shop and build actually this little model boat that you guys can see on the screen. Um, that's modeled after the fishing vessel veteran. Um, and so kids can come in and they get to assemble their own little model boat um, and paint it and take it home. But obviously, again, with COVID restrictions, we weren't able to invite families in as we traditionally would. Um, so with a team of volunteers, we were able to also make this um, kind of a, a at a distance program as well. Um, so instead of gathering in the boat shop, we converted this to a boat in, the ba boat in a bag program. Um, so people could go online and actually purchase this little kit. Um, and the kit included the model boat parts, um, some sandpaper, uh, some paints and paint brushes. And so kids could actually come and pick up their little model boat kit and then they get, could take that home um, and build it and paint it in the comfort of their own home. Thank you. And just moving forward, as mentioned in the annual report, as the Washington State Guidelines will allow as we move through our phases, 
We are going to obviously continue the annual auction this year, but we also are going to introduce docent led tours that will be free to the public. And in, in order to control capacity and group size, we are gonna have reservations scheduled on the um, boat shop website, which Monica is currently implementing. We're also gonna open up the livery boat rentals um, for people that wanna get out on the water in the harbor this, this summer. And then also working with the um, Washington State Sea Grant Program, which we have historically, uh, we're doing instructional programs such as First State at Sea uh, for commercial fishermen and recreational boaters that is open to all with pre-registration and limited to group capacity as well. Future programming as we look forward, um, we have family boat building, which is currently paused since it, the family does work in close proximity with the instructor. We're also looking at new programs um, with some instructors to do a mini boat school for like a 16 foot launch, as well as some pond boat building. Those are the little mini boats that you see people, you know, putting out on the ponds and floating around. So those are fun. So in terms of numbers, uh, taking a look at our programming hours. Now, obviously with our closure, much less than in 2019, which was a great year. Um, but what this represents is the number of persons by the hour that are present for programs, which include the workshops, concerts, boat building, and the like. In addition, uh, in 2020, there is very few visitors. Um, this is just for Q1. However, I'd like to point out that in 2019, you know, the boat shop recorded its highest number of visitors through guest book sign-ins, and that's within the retail store as well as the workshop. And so we do get a lot of uh, foot traffic through the harbor. We're in a great location there, right on the corner. And so people come into the retail store quite a bit and they'll walk down to the dock and, you know, pop their head in and we'll give them a tour and, um, you know, sign the guest book as well. So that's our method of recording visitors um, through the, the boat yard. In terms of volunteer hours, it remains somewhat steady because I mentioned earlier a lot of the um, work that needed to be done was uh, done on a volunteer basis in order to keep the facility operational as well as the advocacy. So we did record um, about 38, 40 uh, volunteer hours there. In terms of income, um, it's mainly received from individual and business direct contributions, donated goods, grant revenue, including uh, uh, grants from the city, membership renewals, our Q1 programs that were revenue generating before the shutdown, uh, the online auction, as well as a few retail sales. In terms of expenses, um, just to call out on the side here, the salary is basically just for um, you know, one part-time employee. Contract services represents our instructor fees for when we did hold the um, boat building workshops. Um, cost of goods, I'm sorry, I need to minimize this to see my screen, uh, is mainly for retail. Operations is materials and veteran expenses, insurance, uh, liability, uh, directors and officers. And the veteran has been put up on layup insurance, which means that we can't take people out for tours right now, which we can't really do anyway, so we're getting a discounted rate on the insurance. Uh, facilities cost is mainly utilities. Office, we um, incorporated some costs for postage for the online auction as a direct mailer to announce it, as well as some marketing expenses for printing and uh, donor and member management. And then the other is just for licenses, permits, and uh, credit card processing fees and the other bucket. Um, okay, we're back here. So here is our 2020 income expense statement. And as you can see, um, you know, numbers were a lot less in 2020 than 2019, but by conserving the resources that we had on hand, uh, the boat shop is currently in a fair financial position to, and we're ready to resume programs and operating as the Gig Harbor Community Tourist Facility and as the city and the Washington state guidelines will allow. So any questions? Yes, I can. Oh, Council Member Dinson. Sorry, I'll start over. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. And it looks like you guys have adapted well. And I'm excited that you're, you are going to be doing your best to have some programming this year. And 
the boat livery service is great and, and all of that. So congratulations. <laughs> Hopefully we continue to make improvements um, with our COVID numbers so that can move forward. I had a question about your income. Um, so the, the city council approved, I think close to 300,000 for the carriage rail system this year. So where is that reported in your income? Or how is, how is that counted? It's well, this is only up till 2020. Oh, so that would be in 2021. Right. Okay, I just wanted wanted to check in on that because we were very, very excited to, to be able to do that for, for the boat shop so that you can move forward with becoming, you know, a fully operational boat shop. Well, thank you. Um, Council member, uh, or Jeff, Jeff Langhill. Uh, yes, I just want to clarify. I understand that uh, the railways will likely be shown in 2021 income expenses, but uh, to be clear, the city is actually paying for the manufacturing of the rails out of our uh, own revenues, and then it'll be something that is given to the boat shop. So the city's paying for that. It might not even show up on their income and expense statement. Right, which also probably showed past years when we helped them with the rails too, it probably didn't show up there on theirs. Council Member Markley. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sharon and Monica for the presentation and also to Lindsay Stover. I wanted to tell you all, I'm just so impressed by your creativity in, in the pandemic. Everybody had to just quickly think on their toes about how to switch things around, how to turn things virtual, how to make it safe for people. And I'm just so impressed by all of our community groups that have done such amazing things to keep the community engaged. And I think my nephews even had a couple of those little boats at Christmas time to paint themselves and they loved it. And so just thank you for what you do for our community and thank you for your programs. They really do make a difference and they really do keep this community um, talking to each other and interacting with each other in a positive way and bringing a little bit of cheer in the, in the middle of a rough time. So just wanted to say thank you both for your presentations and we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your support. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Sharon and Monica. It was, uh, it was great to hear it. Thank you all very much for your presentations. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, with that, we'll do the mayor's report. We have a proclamation of Essential Workers Appreciation Week. Um, I would like to think, thank, um, even though many council members, all council members were supportive of this. Uh, uh, this was council member Franich that brought this uh, to count, uh, the last council meeting, saying that he really wanted to uh, recognize the grocery store and retail association. So uh, we had other council members involved as well. And so proclamation of the mayor of the city of Gig Harbor and council. Whereas we have been experiencing a very challenging year last year. I don't know if you can put this up on the board, Josh or Molly. I'll start reading it. And if you can, that's great. Whereas we have been experiencing a very challenging last year due to the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas we have all needed to continue relying on essential services, and whereas the Center of Disease and Control Prevention define essential workers as those who conduct a range of operations and services in industries that are essential to ensure the continuity of critical functions in the United States to include workers who directly interact with the public in the fields of grocery stores, food and agricultural, education, health and public health, health care and public health, law enforcement and public safety, government-based critical functions, our municipal employees, shipping and transportation, housing and real estate, energy and utility services, retail and professional services, nonprofits providing community services. Whereas many stores provide these services remain operating during this time. And whereas these workers dedication to providing these services to put them in many cases in contact with hundreds of people each day. And whereas these workers still showed up for work to provide essential services we all depend on in our everyday lives. Now, therefore, we take this time to officially recognize our grocery stores and essential workers 
as an important part to maintain the daily order of our lives and in appreciation of these workers putting themselves and their families in potential harm's way. And the mayor and the council proclaimed the week of April 26th through May 3rd, 2021 as essential appreciation week in the city of Gig Harbor and encourage all citizens to express their appreciation for all these workers and what they have done. Thank you. Uh, the second item from the mayor's report, I just wanted to let uh, the council and the public know that we did have the YMCA sports complex lease originally on the uh, docket for this meeting. And then we had to pull it because there were a couple more things that we had to figure out with, uh, with the YMCA. Um, I, I did reach out the following day, I guess that was like last Wednesday and reached out to the Y and we worked through those last two issues. So um, that, that was great. And uh, Daniel, and their attorney have actually worked on the lease. I actually called uh, Charlie, the CEO of the YMCA today to make sure that he um, was in agreement that we're moving forward and uh, their board seems pleased. So we are gonna present this to council at a study session on May 6th so that they can take a deep dive. And then hopefully shortly after that, we'll, we'll pass it uh, uh, at the following council meeting with support of the council and the why. So we are moving forward uh, to get that going. Council member Aversol. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I was just gonna ask for maybe some more clarification because I was afraid that people are gonna hear that and lose their minds thinking sure, they, don't, sure. they don't have information and what does all that mean? And so uh, the, the things that we had to figure out were, you know, we, <clears throat> if in fact we end up building the um, 1B before they get around to theirs, we want the public restrooms and we want the, the public restrooms had a concession stand. They were gonna build it when 1A was built. We don't want porta potties for uh, a 1B, a pickleball, a vent lawn and all that, that wouldn't be good. So we wanted to make it so that if in fact the Y does follow through with uh, their commitment, they would reimburse us for the uh, restrooms and the concession stand. So that was one thing that we had to work through um, the other one, let's see, what was it? It was um, the original MOU said that, um, that if the sports come, if the YMCA did pull out by spring of 2023, 20, that they would be reimbursed uh, the work that they had done of the grade, the, the reports, documents that someone would need to go ahead and pursue building it. And so they wanted that put in there that they would be reimbursed in, if in fact we uh, we need that information, and so we've worked through that. So you you council knows most of what what is already in, in the whole agreement. Um, it's not really that new. We've already shared a lot of it with you. It's just the fine details that we had to get through. So we'll be bringing that to you uh, May sixth, and it's the YMCA that wanted more time due to the pandemic. And so we've uh, allowed them more time because we've worked this long with them. Uh, how Was that pretty good or do you want more clarity? <laughs> okay, thank you. We have three years of clarity. So <laughs> we're working to get it done. Great, and with that concludes the mayor's uh, report. And with that, we've got the city administrator's report. Uh, COVID update, uh, Bob Larson. Thank you, mayor. Uh, members of the council, members of the public, Tonight, I'm going to uh, provide you information about a program called the American Rescue Plan. It's a coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery fund that was established by Congress. In early March, Congress passed a bill providing fiscal assistance to all levels of government, including municipalities. The estimated payment to Gig Harbor is $2.33 million. This estimate is not official and is subject to change. Funds would be distributed in two allotments, the first half in 2021 and the second half in 2022. And then the deadline to spend the funds is December 31st of 2024. Back in March and April, on March 18th, we advised the council that we were planning to hold a study session in April to discuss and recommend projects or program costs we've incurred or will incur that we think will be eligible expenditures for these federal funds. 
At that time, we had stated that cities can use the funds for these general purposes. First one is responding to COVID-19 pandemic or its negative economic impacts. Second one would be, uh, would be recovering costs incurred from the public health emergency. The third one is replacing loss, decreased or delayed city revenues caused by the pandemic. And the fourth one would be uh, making necessary investments in water, sewer and broadband infrastructure. And all those would have to be related in some way, shape, or form to the pandemic itself. To date, we have not received any additional details about the eligible costs. But once we receive those detailed program information, staff will proceed to study to schedule the study session with council. We've also been notified more recently that the state will be distributing these funds through its Office of Financial Management. We will work with OFM to determine what the process will be for distributing the funds to our city. Mayor Kuhn, staff, and I have de developed a preliminary list for use of the funds that have been allocated to Gig Harbor. And they include Harbor View, Stinson Sanitary Sewer Repair, the Civic Center, Heating, Ventilation, and Air Conditioning Overhaul and Replacement, repaying the, the water utility base fees that were waived in spring of 2020, the Council Chambers and Municipal Court video and audio modifications, and workplace and workstation modifications. Again, if any of these are eligible, they would, excuse me, they would have to be eligible for funding and they would have to meet the criteria that we have not seen yet from the uh, Office of Financial Management or from the federal government. And then in preparation for the study session, staff will develop estimated costs for each of these items listed above to facilitate our discussion with council. Thank you, and I might add the the sewer repair, as we know, is probably an excess of 700,000. That's see, I don't have that there anymore. And the, um, the Civic Center overhaul is, a, is, a, um, is the air conditioning unit here that uh, our, our, our maintenance people have been putting Band-Aids every year and it's getting worse and worse. And that needs to be done. The water treatment, the, the water utility, that's $588,000 that we gave back to the public and the court, we want to get back to having our court and our council meetings in the chambers, but we can't do that without uh, people from the public being able to see us as well. And even though this is working, we don't have it set downstairs to get to make that happen. And then all the workplace and workstation modifications so that we can bring staff back. So these, these are uh, big, big deals that we need to work on. So that'll be good. Thank you, Bob. And with that, we've got a staff report, our first quarter finance report, and our first quarter budget status report. Um, Dave Rodenbach. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, for the financial report, we're right on track this year. Uh, we're right around 25, 26% in revenues. And traditionally, we lag in expenditures because we have a lot of large projects that aren't linear uh, month to month. And so we're at about 11% in expenditures. And more specifically, sales taxes are right on track, as are some of our other taxes. Property taxes, not so much because the big payments come in April and May. And also attached to this are the departmental budget objective reports. And I'm told that we're not, we're not wanting to get into that in too much detail tonight, but I'll, I'll take any questions. I understand the study session for Thursday is to dig into this and get into the details. With that, I'll open it for any questions. Sounds good. We'll talk about Thursday. Uh, and you have got an uh, auditor's exit conference uh, that we had, uh, Dave. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to say the audit is the audit of fiscal year 2019 is finally done. It, uh, we had a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say problems. There was just a lot of uh, logistical issues. We had the auditor leave and, and confusion and providing records and whatnot. We came out with a clean audit. Uh, meaning the city has, or the city, the state auditor has blessed our financial statements and they present fairly the results of operations and the financial position of the city for all of our funds, utilities and, and every fund, general fund and whatnot. It also says that we complied with state laws that would be material to our operations. So in other words, uh, we followed state laws, laws relative to budgeting. Uh, gift of public funds, open public meetings. Uh, they open us up to a lot of scrutiny and 
we passed pretty much pretty much flying colors because we didn't get written up for anything. So I'm happy to say that's done. And we're just about ready to start the new audit, <laughs> hopefully later towards the end of the summer. But with that, I'll take any questions. Great. Well, that, that report by the auditors went really well. I was impressed. Uh, City Administrator Bob Larson. I just wanted to add to what David said and just acknowledge Dave's involvement as well as his entire staff, as well as other staff, uh, notably <laughs> Linda and Payroll and others who obviously were uh, were uh, part and parcel to this being, being successful. It was a tough time of the year that the auditor came in at the end of our fiscal year. We were obviously closing up uh, books on the 20, 2020 year and getting into 2021. And it was uh, especially ar arduous with the, with the auditor, uh, as Dave said, was uh, also losing some staff at the time. But I just want to commend all of our staff for, for the wonderful work they did. It, they, we obviously couldn't have done it without their, uh, their efforts. And they, they went to extraordinary lengths to get it done. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Thank you, Dave. That sounds great. Uh, public comment now on non-agenda items. Uh, this is for people. This is for items that are not on the agenda. So, for those uh, 33 people that are listening, it, it, this is for something that's not firework related. Fireworks, just so you know, uh, that, that is on the agenda. Uh, so with that, I will turn to Bob Larson to see if anyone, uh, where I'm, I'm opening up the public comment for items not on the public agenda. Are there any written public comments to read, Bob? Mayor, Council, I do not have any uh, comments on non-agenda items this evening. Thank you. Now I will turn to the callers. I see one caller, caller uh, 874. Uh, you uh, please say your name and address, or you might be 1253. Yes, Mayor Kuhn, City Council members, can you hear me okay? Yes, they can. Yes, uh, name is Thomas Wick. I'm at Hunt Street Northwest, just outside Gig Harbor City Limits. Um, I'm here to ask some questions. I know you guys don't respond with answers during public comment, but I'm going to present this um, comment as a question. So I'm watching development within the courtyards, or excuse me, within the Scancy Avenue um, drainage. Um, it appears to be accelerating. Um, I'm watching a lot of houses going up really quick. And that development, the development within the Scancy drainage was approved under the auspices that there was a drainage, stormwater drainage conveyance ditch that basically traversed our properties to Balachet Avenue flowing straight south. That drainage conveyance ditch does not exist. And Mayor Kuhn, you were informed of this before the first trees were cut. And my father-in-law and I put $20,000 on the table, $10,000 in two separate occasions, in which we offered to pay the city if they would acknowledge and sanction a drainage evaluation. And the city has refused. I went to Pierce County and said, Pierce County, we would like you to do this drainage evaluation. We would like you to document this drainage evaluation. We would like you to update the GIS map and we'll pay for it. That was met with silence. So my question and my concern is what is the end game? Because we, our properties are downhill and development's continuing. And as each new home gets built, the runoff, the volume only increases. Nobody has approached my father-in-law or myself to discuss alternatives, options, installation of a drainage ditch. I know they can't because of the wetland, I know. So there's, there's complications there. But the concern, Mayor Kuhn, is what's the end game? And what happens with the new mayor in January, February of next year. I don't know who's gonna be elected, no one does, but this issue is gonna fall right on their lap. And I find it to be the most extraordinary injustice. Um, and I, I, I don't know what, like I said, I don't know what the end game is. I don't know what the city's defense is. Um, I certainly hope it's not the fact that there's a bond in place that says, hey, we're protected. If, if, if this doesn't go right and there's a bad outcome, we're good. Um, because state law says you can't flood the wetland. 
and you can't bond your way out of state law. It's from my from my from where I stand. Maybe your city attorney can correct me. Um, so that's what I wanted to convey to city council tonight is why hasn't construction stopped pending the completion of a drainage evaluation and the identification of an appropriate and adequate drainage for development occurring within the Scancy drainage? That's my question because it leaves me perplexed beyond belief. And I thank you very much for allowing my public comment on this issue this evening. Thank you. Are there any other public comments from the callers? Okay, we will close just we will close the public comment. And our first item tonight is old business, uh, second reading of ordinance 1460, amending fireworks regulations. Uh, this is the second reading. And uh, we will we will take public comment because we didn't say that we would not at the first reading. So if, if we're not going to take it on second readings, which a lot of times we shouldn't, we never announced that on the first one. So we will be taking public comment. Uh, the, the report will be from our building official, Fire Marshal Paul Rice. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I'm seeing in the attendees that Robert Wood had his hand up when Mr. Wick was also speaking. I saw that too, and then I couldn't find him. His hand was down. Um, it's Mayor, this is Bob Larson. It's actually back up again for Robert Wood. Okay. All right, I will, um, I, I can't see him. Um, just one second. Okay, now I see it. it um, I will backtrack and open up the public comment for the person that had his hands up again. Uh, I didn't see him. He was at the top. I think uh, there's more people than my one screen show, so I have to scroll up and down. Uh, Robert Wood, you've got the floor. Three minutes. Uh, state your name and address, please. My name is Robert Wood. I live at 375 27th Street Northwest in Gig Harbor. And I have a comment about fireworks. Is this the appropriate time to do that? No, it's not. But I will let you. We. Uh, we had stated several times that if something's on the agenda, then you talk during that item, but we're just about ready to go into that. So I will let you be the first caller. So if you want to keep your hand up, I'll call on you first in just a little bit. Very good. Thank you. You bet. Okay. So I'm going to close the public comment on non-agenda items. Get back to that. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and good evening, Council. Uh, as you had mentioned, uh, this is the second reading of an ordinance that would revise the city's fireworks regulations regarding the allowable days of discharge. Uh, on September 21st, 2020, the Council's Finance and State Committee provided direction to staff to bring to the full council an amendment that would revise our currently allowable four days of discharge from July 1st through the 4th to just one day, that being the 4th of July. Uh, during the fourth, first reading, um, Police Chief Kelly Busey provided some comment on prior enforcement and the department's ability to enforce the proposed new regulation. Uh, there was also public testimony as well as council comment and the pros proposed ordinance was advanced to the second reading. Um, I'd like to mention that uh, prior to the first reading, a request for public comment went out um, through various uh, means, including the city's social media accounts and responses were provided uh, by the public directly to the council for consideration. Um, additional comments have come in over the past two weeks and staff has compiled the information and broken it down based on those recommendations. Um, out of uh, 233 comments, uh, approximately 74% uh, were in support of the ordinance as written, 11% uh, were against it and would like things to stay as is, 11% uh, would like an all out ban on fireworks. Um, and there was uh, approximately 4% that it was fell in the other category. Either comments weren't provided uh, as far as a recommendation or some other uh, proposal uh, was made. A state law requires that any changes to fireworks regulations at the local level uh, must be adopted at least 12 months prior to the effective date, making these provisions uh, enforceable for the 20 22 holiday season. Um, I would be uh, more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. 
And I, I know that we have quite a bit of public comments as well. Um, great, thank you. Um, Kelly, do you, yeah, you're right. Kelly, do you have the information that you sent us on the, on the violation uh, penalties uh, that you had sent me for a little bit to put it on the screen? If not, I can hand it to Molly. I, uh, it, I don't have it to be able to put it on the screen right now, no. Okay, okay, I'll I hand it to Molly. I can summarize my thought though. Yeah, um, Molly, can you put something on the screen a little bit if I ask you to? Okay. Unfortunately, if I don't have it already scanned in or electronically, I can't. Okay. Okay. And Kelly, it was at April 22nd, 3.11. I don't know if you can find April <laughs> 22nd, 3.11 PM, but uh, it was fireworks proposed penalty amendment. So it's a discussion, a thousand dollars versus a hundred. Um, but we'll go into that later. So we have some clarity questions for, uh, uh, for staff, uh, Council Member Rodenberg. Yes, um, official Paul Rice. Uh, that, that was an awful lot of comments, but uh, I got copied on those just like everyone else did. And I know that more than half of those, uh, there wasn't any identification of where the person lived uh, or even their names. A lot of them were just uh, uh, bigjoe at msn.com. And what were doing when we allow those comments and when we allow those to influence our policy making is we're letting somebody that could live in North Dakota uh, or the Ukraine kind of determine what our policy is. I think that comments, uh, unfortunately, shouldn't be considered unless someone is willing to give their name with them. Uh, so I, and I do think it's, I think at the last, at the first reading, I talked about the in the last six years, uh, there was only one uh, instance where the police department was called out where they had uh, enough reason to file a, a formal complaint. So one formal complaint in six years. And I think uh, the fire department wasn't called out uh, for a fire at that could be caused by fireworks in that entire six years. And I, I think that's important to note that because so many of those comments called out the fire danger and people getting hurt. And I, I just think that responsible people uh, using fireworks are, are not a danger. So could you, do you have any idea of how many of those comments were not identifiable other than just the total quantity? It was just a, a basic straw poll. I know that, as you mentioned, all of them went directly to um, to each of the council members as well as to the mayor. Um, and you just basically have to go through. Uh, a lot of the people that even did identify themselves were were very clear. You know, I live in Purdy or I live out on Fox Island. Um, I live just outside of the city limits. Um, there were quite a few that that uh, were in the in the city limits, and I know that we have a few. Uh, folks that are going to speak this evening that uh, that are in the city limits as well, but um, it's really difficult um, with uh, you know any type of a, a straw poll like that uh, that goes out you know as far as uh, electronically to to pin down you know exactly where they're as you'd mentioned exactly where they're coming from. So it's one of those you know grain of salt type. type and situations, anything we I decide think. here tonight is not going to have any validity where those people live at all. Correct. Correct. Yeah, there was one comment talked about uh, the fumes traveling 62 miles. Well, no matter what we do here, we're going to get fumes from 62 miles away. So I, I just think all those comments should have been really looked at critically instead of just popularly. Okay, Council Member Denson. Yes, Inspector Rice, could you just repeat those percentages for me? I couldn't write them down fast enough. From the responses, it was uh, the the pro supporting the the amendment was seventy four percent. There was eleven percent against, and would like for things to stay the same as they are. Eleven uh, percent would like an all out ban on fireworks completely, and then there was a a four percent where there was either 
um, not a recommendation, just a statement that was made um, and or another type of uh, recommendation that didn't fall in, in any of the majority categories, such as um, we'd like things to be consistent with the city of you know, Bellevue or something like that. Just a lot of different, different uh, recommendations that may have been made. There was a couple that were um, wanted a two day um, period, say the third and the fourth. Um, that was, I think around 1% or so. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Aversole. I'm sorry. Um, my computer is going crazy. Someone or something is controlling my mouse. I'm not even touching it. And it's logging me around. I don't know if I'm on screen share with somebody, um, but uh, someone's in control of my computer at the moment and it's not me. But uh, I would just say that I appreciate all the comments that the public um, Gave and I'll be supporting of this. Thank you. Um, and then uh, one thing I would like council to consider uh, with this um, is uh, Molly. I just sent you and I, or you can share. Let me share the screen. I also sent it to Kelly. I, I have it, Mary Kim. Okay. Well, I, if you could put it on the screen, I want people to consider something with this. Maybe amendment to this to include this. Right now, our current penalty violation, if you put off a firework, is $1,000. So if you do it outside of the time, it's $1,000. You know, I don't think we really want kids to be grounded for four years to have their parents pay $1,000. Um, it's very hard, uh, Chief QC mentioned writing a ticket for $1,000. And um, you know, it's gonna be hard to enforce. So. There is, uh, there is a consideration to change the penalty to maybe $100, or if they're under a certain age, do some do four or six hours of community service. So um, I, think, I think it's a little bit much, $1,000. And so I think it's a, it, uh, people do make mistakes. And, and so Kelly, is it possible to put that up on the screen? Right, if somebody can give me uh, privileges to do that. I'll... Yeah, uh, would that be Josh? Yes. Great. I'm and trying, again, I'm not able to. This is just for council. You know, this is nothing to do with the amount of days. It's just something for, I, I don't know. I wasn't aware of three weeks ago that it was $1,000 uh, of a fine. So, uh, Josh, are you able to? I'm trying to find a way to make him presenter, and I am not able to. I sent it to you too, Molly, if you wanted to. Kelly, Kelly's a panelist. He has the access. I'm not sure why he's not able to see it. I'm double checking to see if there's anything I can do to help him. There we go. Okay, so the current fine is $1,000. <laughs> so um, maybe, uh, Kelly, well, I'll let you explain this. Right, our municipal code only allows infractions in three amounts, $100, $500, or $1,000. I don't know the history on how we arrived at $1,000 for a fireworks fine, but as uh, Mary Kuhn alluded, uh, $1,000 is a bit hard to hand out when we're talking about 15, 16 year old kids. So as a side note, kind of to the, the main discussion tonight and something that maybe you could consider or take back to committee uh, would be an alteration of the penalty to lower it to $100 and also incorporate uh, the mechanism that we've done in other ordinances where the municipal court could authorize the violator to provide up to eight hours of community service. So, you know, 15, 16 year old kid that gets caught shooting off fireworks outside of the hours could do four or five hours of community service. As an alternative uh, that I've drafted below that is keep it uh, at $100 during the state allowed uh, days of June 28th to July 5th but increase that penalty to $1,000 if we're well outside of the state um, guidelines there. So I just offer that as something uh, more of a discussion, uh, possible amendment for you, or again, something you could perhaps take back to committee to consider. Great, now before you get rid of that, so I, I would, um, if, so, if council so moves, I would hope that maybe a council member with whatever they propose tonight would maybe amend uh, the council bill to do eight, 0.20.150, the first one, uh, $100 instead of 1,000. 
uh, with eight hours of community or, or eight hours of community service. I don't think it needs a study session if and a lot of um, a lot of time, but I think it would make sense to do that. If someone wants to do it, we can easily get the wordage from right there. And with that, we'll go back to this or other or our regional item. Council Member Wook. Yes, I serve on the uh, Finance and Safety Committee. And uh, just as we've had other issues, I think we had bicycle helmets. The fine for that come to the Finance and Safety Committee. I would recommend that uh, this fine uh, also come to the Finance and Safety Committee before anything is done. Okay. Um, Council Member Aversol. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm okay with $1,000. I, I think that um, have, holding a parent responsible uh, to police their children as far as lighting up uh, potentially dangerous uh, explosives that can burn down houses, um, you know, put fireballs into people's eyes with Roman candles and things like that. I think the onus needs to be put on the parents and give them a valid excuse to monitor their kids with these things. Because I remember growing up, uh, my parents, they gave me a couple hundred bucks. I went up, bought the fireworks, went and lit them off. My parents never saw those things going off. They never were around. I blew them off in my hand. Um, and I think there needs to be better parenting on this issue. So I'm okay with a thousand dollar fine. Okay, Council Member Hines. Hines. Uh, yes, along that same line, um, uh, I believe that enforcement of this via fines or police action is going to be uh, um, slight, let me put it that way. And I think that's what the chief indicated to us last time, it would be difficult. Uh, I believe education is the key to this whole thing. And if you wanna take education seriously, you put a thousand dollar fine in there and make sure everybody understands what the penalty will be if they do violate it. And that may be the biggest way or the best way to enforce this particular um, uh, ordinance, if, if it becomes an ordinance, uh, versus trying to catch people in the act. And I agree with the chief, you can't be everywhere all the time. So uh, I, I think it's critical that, uh, that we uh, retain the $1,000. Uh, and by the way, I, I would ask the chief, if, have we had complaints about you know teenagers that don't have enough money to go to GameStop or whatever because they've uh, set off fireworks or enlighten me on that. Well, we wouldn't receive that sort of feedback, Council Member Himes. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to take that as none. Okay, <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure with the, the outspoken residents of Gig Harbor, had it happened, I'm sure you'd hear about it. So uh, I, I'll take that as a big zero. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll open it up, Council Member Markley. Thank you. So in the original language in the 8.20.150, it says it's an infraction subject to a maximum penalty of $1,000. Does that mean that depending on what it, what it was, depending on what type of firework or what damage it may have caused, is that, is that um, something decided by the officer that's there based on what happened? Is, is that amount a thousand dollars or is it up to a thousand dollars and it can be 100 500 or a thousand we we would write it as a thousand dollars and if they wanted to take it to court for a mitigation it could be lowered okay got it thank you council member franich yes chief um are do you know of any other civil infractions in our municipal code that has a thousand dollar fine gosh i'd have to look i off the top of my head i do not and um, what is the 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 um, the burden or the what needs to take place before somebody could be cited? Does the officer need to um, actually witness 
somebody with a match in their hand lighting a firework what's the threshold for um issuing this civil infraction right it has to occur in an officer's presence um, in other words, we'd have to um, be either witnessing it firsthand or have some direct evidence, video evidence, or um, something right at the scene that, that we can tie directly to a person. So does that mean if, uh, if, uh, if a bystander took a picture, took a video, and it had a time thing on the video, then that would be evidence that could be used against that person? We, we could probably issue an infraction on that, yes. Could be an argument at court, but yes. And then it would tie up our courts as well. Uh, could. Yeah. yeah. Council member Rodenberg. That's exactly was going to be my point. I think a uh, hundred dollar fine uh, is is a good education. I don't think any parent is going to let their child uh, walk free, and if the parent has to pay hundred dollar fine, but I think for a thousand dollar fine, the parent would possibly take it to court wondering if it's even enforceable. And just like you said, Mayor, uh, tie up the courts for someone lighting off a firework. So I'm, I'm not in favor of thousand dollar fine. Right. And you know, my, my, my kid, my parents weren't watching me when I was 13 and, and Aversold, you said they weren't watching you. And I don't think every 13 year old wants their parents around them 24 hours a day. So it's, it's, um, if they, if they light off a, a sparkler or a, or a pop out rocket at a thousand dollar fine, I think it's in this, in today's society, I think that's pretty harsh, but council member Jensen. Oh yes. Can you hear me? I yep. think you've disappeared from my own screen. <laughs> Something's controlling my computer too, Councilmember Aversold. Um, I just want to say this is clearly a complicated discussion. It's a good discussion. I think it's one that we need to have, but I agree with Councilmember Wook that this should go to committee because it clearly there's a lot to think about here and we have a lot of citizens waiting to talk about the main issue tonight. So I, I'd like us to move on to that. I'm just waiting until councilors are, are done with their hands raised to open up public comment. Councilmember Hines. Yeah. I. Uh... I would agree, first of all, with Council Member Denson, and I would add, having been in line uh, at the fireworks tent behind uh, people buying fireworks, let me tell you, a hundred bucks is pin money into that tent, from what I have seen. Two to four hundred dollars is definitely in the ballpark as far as uh, buying fireworks here in Gig Harbor. So I don't think that would be a deterrent to anybody, okay? That would be a kind of more of a cost of doing business in the fireworks business. So uh, anyway, that's my two cents worth. Can we just go OK, so we will now open up the public comment. Um, we're going to start with the ones that are written. And there's quite a few. And then the people that are calling in. If you do agree with the caller behind uh, or in front of you, um, if you're going to kind of repeat the same thing that they said, you can always say, I agree with the past caller um just to try to make it so that there's less duplication you know, again say, say in your opinion but if it's already been said maybe keep that in mind i think we have 33 written comments to read or something like that is i would turn that uh, more than that so um i would turn it over to uh, bob larson and molly i think they're working on this together <laughs> thank you mayor members of the council members of the public we do have a uh, significant number of uh, comments, but uh, Molly will pick it up after I've uh, had a chance to read off several of these. Okay, one thing, Did, well, Council Mayor Jensen, can you wait since I opened up the public comment? Yeah, I just thought maybe... Okay, we can't hear you. Sorry, I just thought maybe we should consider letting the folks that are on the phone go first and then read, I mean, just an idea, then read the comments. Um, we're gonna, I'm sure a lot of these people are people that have also written their comments too. And so, we're going to stay with the procedure we've done for many years or or at least in yeah for two years go ahead all right the first one is uh from erica dietrich she uh writes dear city council please keep the current four days as a standard for fireworks use this is an american tradition rich in history and the celebration of our nation's founding should not ever be be, be banned please read this message at the next council meeting thank you erica dietrich Next one comes from 
Heather McFarland, she's on Sherman Drive, Burley Lagoon. I live on Burley Lagoon on the verge of Gig Harbor's UGA. Since 1964, our family considered Gig Harbor a second home since mom and dad did all their shopping at Organs and Thriftway. They, like those vendors, are no longer with us, but we are drawn to Gig Harbor because we remain a maritime family in spirit. And most importantly, I can escape the 4th of July mayhem on the lagoon by viewing the wonderful, wonderful displays in the harbor among enjoyable friends. And if the celebration could be limited to the most important date, 4th of July, people might better recall what and why we celebrate that date in such a glorious manner. This is the year to bring that message home and with so much vice and this past year, it is a great opportunity to focus and bring us all together. In the future, the council may consider contacting the European company that has perfected soundless fireworks. A bit of a misnomer, but I've seen displays of celebrations in Spain and Italy with fantastic light shows just like old fashioned displays, but no blasting noise. Respectfully submitted, Heather McFarland. Next one is from Dave Willis, 6707 Rainier Avenue, Gig Harbor. We are not in favor of changing the 4th of July fireworks local Gig Harbor law to only one day. Too many laws changing people's freedoms. Please record this for the upcoming meeting. Next one is from Kevin Kennedy, 9805 43rd Avenue, Gig Harbor. Hello, City of Gig Harbor officials. I understand fireworks in Gig Harbor is under discussion on April 26th. Please ban all fireworks by private individuals if possible. Definitely restrict the use as much as possible. If fireworks must be allowed, limit the use to one day on the 4th of July. The dangers to life and limb are well known as well as fire risk and property damage. The noise is horrible for animals. Please protect your citizens and their animals with new restrictions and strict enforcement. Thanks, Kevin S. Kennedy. Next one comes from Jane Kennedy, 9805 43rd Avenue, Gig Harbor. Dear Mayor and City Council members, I am very much in support of limiting fireworks to only July 4th. Actually, I would like to see personal fireworks banned completely in this area. There is no need for them. The noise is terrifying to animals and many run away due to the noise. Many of us, including myself, don't sleep all night because people are shooting them off after the designated time every single year. They pay no attention to the time restraints and nothing is done about it. In a drought, they are also a huge danger for starting fires. My son is a hand surgeon. He has seen countless hands, arms, and fingers burned off by these personal fireworks. It's also senseless. If you cannot ban them completely, please, please limit them to just one day and set night limits to them so they don't blast all night. And enforce this rule too, please. Thank you, Jane Kennedy. Next one is from Linda Plum and Her Barry Lewis, 2812 Harborview Drive. Please, please, please limit fireworks to one day on the 4th. I wish Gig Harbor would follow some other cities' leads and ban them all together. If people use safe and sane fireworks only, the harbor would not be such a war zone. But no, almost everyone uses the illegal Indian reservation bombs that not only shatter my nerves, but completely freak out my animals. What about all the wildlife? They have nowhere to get away from the horrendous auditory onslaught. A miserable couple of days for all concerned. We are either forced to leave town for several days around the 4th, which is an economic burden, or heavily sedate our animals. Neither is a desirable option. If the city enforced the law to prohibit the legal fireworks, we'd have a, safe, a safer and much saner 4th. However, it appears that the police either can't or won't enforce that law. So the only option remaining is to ban fireworks completely or at least limit them to one day. Thank you for listening. And the Plum and Barry Lewis. Next one comes from Kent Holder, 917 Camas Way, Fox Island. As a retired firefighter for 34 years, I must urge the council to consider my opinion from a professional experience basis. During my career, 1963 to 1997, Huntington Beach Fire Department, California, population 200,000 plus, the damage I witnessed done by co competent and incompetent revelers with the use of safe and sane fireworks was nothing short of devastating. Use of these fireworks over extended periods of time, more than simply allowed on the holiday, caused needless extra damage to property, injuries sustained by revelers, and terror rained down upon defenseless animals. Because of their legality, the only way to limit losses would be to limit the allotted time for their use. I urge you to use common sense and the knowledge of the statistical damage resulting from these fireworks to make the only sensible decision. Limit the damage to the holiday, 4th of July only. 
Also, please consider that the profits from the sale of fireworks does not justify or equal the loss of a single child's eyesight, someone's property, or the loss of responsible citizens' sanctity of peace and quiet. Respectfully, Ken Holder, HBFD, retired. Molly, would you mind picking up from here for a little bit and catch my sure. breath? Okay, the first one is from B. Mezzi Rhodes, uh, 36th Avenue. She says, good morning, this is my second email, respectfully requesting that the Gig Harbor City Council consider amending the city's fireworks ordinance. I request the email be read and entered into the record at the council meeting of April 26, 2021. I strongly support amending the hours of allowable discharge from the current four days, July 1st to the 4th, to one day only, July 4th. Fireworks are noisy, noise pollution, disruptive and can be dangerous. They are damaging to the health of wildlife, household pets, dogs, cats, etc., children and veterans, especially those suffering from PTSD. The welfare of residents should be first and foremost in establishing policy. Thank you for your consideration. Second one is from Linda Heiser. Linda lives on uh, Fox Island. I support one day July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. Unfortunately, I do not have a pony in this race since I live on Fox Island, yet I need to express my reasons for resenting the purely capitalistic TNT fireworks. Excuse the council supports fireworks use beyond Independence Day. I am a retired educator who has witnessed firsthand the fear in autistic individuals who cannot claim, who cannot calm themselves after hearing fireworks. It is the same fear reactions experienced by those with PTSD. Then there are the residents who have tried in vain to calm their pets during the 4th of July. I believe the smartest cities in Western Washington are waking up to the real cost of fireworks and have either banned them or limited them to one day. Lake Stevens is an idyllic setting, much like Gig Harbor. A few years ago, five homes on the north side of the lake were destroyed by fireworks, exceeding 1 million in losses. Lake Stevens has since limited the revelry to one day. In 2018 alone, there were 209 injuries and 92 fires reported statewide due to the use of fireworks. I will not list the cities that have banned or limited fireworks, the city council is aware of that list. Kindly do the proper thing by the residents of Gig Harbor and limit the use of dangerous loud fireworks to July 4th only. Thank you, Mrs. Linda Heiser. Then third one is from Nancy Jerkovich. Dear Mayor and Council, please limit fireworks to one day. The trauma, damage, and load on our fire department could all be lessened. The holiday is only one day and the celebration should be also. Nancy E. Jerkovich, Harborview Drive. Bob Marsick, we are in full support of reducing the use of fireworks to one day, July, or July 4th only. Besides the extreme noise nuisance to pets and people, public safety and reducing the risk of accidental fires should be a first priority. Bob and Bonnie Marsick, over, Overlook Court. Kristen Sutich, uh, McDonald Avenue. I am for one day of fireworks in the city of Gig Harbor. This allows citizens to celebrate and be festive for one day on July 4th. Any more than one day, and I find that firework noise and pollution very bothersome. The noise is disruptive to people and animals and something I never look forward to. It should be a fun holiday but unfortunately, I dread it every year due to the fireworks. Please make this important change for our city of Gig Harbor. Respectfully, Kristen Sudich. This is from Carrie Barker. My husband and I have five acres just outside the city limits and worry every year that stray fireworks are going to set our trees on fire. In addition to the fire hazard, the noise is like a war zone for days before and after the 4th. Our elderly dog was so disturbed that she would shake and hide for those days. It's just too much. We vote for one day only. Thank you. John Farrington. 
Council, thank you for addressing this issue. There were 269 reported injuries last year from fireworks in Washington and 80 fires, half in wilderness areas. One injury is too many and the fire risk is already too high. Please either limit the day, the hours, or eliminate the sale of fireworks. Thank you. Jean Farrington, Starboard Lane. This is Rebecca Floyd. I support one day, July 4th, only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. Fireworks cause much more damage than they are worth. She lives on 84th Avenue, Court. This is from Carrie Lay, who lives on 105th Street Court Northwest. Fireworks should be banned entirely. In the hands of the public, they're nothing but dangerous noise pollution, causing harm to people, animals, and the environment. Please take a step towards common sense by limiting the fireworks to one day. Carrie Lay. This is Kara Alley, and she lives on Crescent Valley Drive. Hello, I'd like to register my comment in support of fireworks for just one day, July 4th. The endless days of fireworks are disruptive to the community and frighten my animals. Thanks. This is from Dave Miller, Tyler Miller, Joey Hugo, Anna Hugo, Kevin Jansen, the managers of a TNT fireworks stand at Safeway parking lot. Dear Mr. Mayor and city council members, I am again writing to make sure to express our opposition to the proposal to amend the hours of allowable discharge of fireworks that would limit them to only one day, July 4th. My family has been running the fireworks stand in the Safeway parking lot since 2017, and this year, 2021, will be our fifth year. While we are not a typical organization, the proceeds earned from our stand directly help members of the Gig Harbor community. Even though the stand is in my name, it is actually run by four college students, all of whom are Gig Harbor High School graduates. The proceeds are divided into five parts and help these kids pay for college. Proceeds from the stand also support the sport they all played at Gig Harbor High School. Tyler Miller, Rochester Institute of Technology, Joey Hugo, University of Santa Clara, Anna Hugo, University of Santa Clara, Kevin Jansen, PLU, Gig Harbor High School Soccer, three of the four kids played for the Tides. Changing the hours of allowable discharge would significantly impact the ability to sell fireworks and raise funds. Most sales of fireworks in the first few days are for novelty items such as poppets, sparklers, and other small items. We would lose these sales if the families who typically purchase these feel like they would be in trouble for lighting these items off before the 4th of July. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, the more significant impact to the sale of fireworks is what day of the week that the 4th of July happens to land in a given year. Our stand averages 1,800 transactions during the seven day sales window. That means over 2,000 people come through our stand each year. This gives us a good opportunity to talk with lots of folks who live in the Gig Harbor area. Many of the families that come into our stand talk about how they are having their big show with family or friends on July 2nd or 3rd because a 4th falls on a weekday and they have to go to work on the 5th. We therefore oppose a proposal to amend the hours of allowable discharge to just July 4th. Not only would it impact early sales, but it would also impact families who have to work on July 5th would have traditionally celebrated on July 2nd or 3rd. We sincerely hope that the mayor and the city council reconsider this amendment. Thank you. P.S. I would like this request to be read. Molly? Yes. Is, I can pick it up if you like for a little bit. Okay. Thank you. The next one is from Barbara Turecki, 4409 88th Avenue Northwest, Gig okay. Harbor. To the members of the Gig Harbor City Council, Please limit the use of fireworks to just one day, July 4th, and please dedicate staff to monitor the elite, illegal letting off of fireworks before and after July 4th. I'm sure you have heard all the arguments against, against letting off fireworks. Fire hazard, harassing noise to both domestic and wild animals, disturbing reminder to PTSD veterans, scary for youngest people and annoyance for older ones, littering nuisance, dangerous to anyone using them, even when they know what they are doing. Thank you for considering this proposal and please vote for it. Barbara Turecki. 
Next one is from Randy and Merritt Wahab. We are very concerned about the health and safety of our neighbors and their pets. Therefore, we fully support the proposed fireworks ordinance limiting the use of fireworks in the city of Big Harbor to one day, July 4th. Randy and Marette Wahab, 11321, Heather Place, Gig Harbor. Next one comes from Yesenia Lamb, 4106, 31st Avenue Court, Gig Harbor. Good evening, council members of Gig Harbor. I decided to speak out on this topic as this topic has stayed on the agenda. As a longtime fireworks consumer, it is a huge part of my family's 4th of July celebration. I don't want to see that limited. I'm against reducing the days of use for fireworks in the city of Gig Harbor. I hear periodic fireworks in the days leading up to the 4th of July. Do I find them nuisance? No, I do not. I find that the consumers that are shooting them, myself included, are doing them at reasonable times of night and must, and must be being safe about their business because I'm not hearing of any issues as a result of their actions. Additionally, I feel that this would be a hard law for a police department to enforce. There are bigger issues for them to tend to. When I think fireworks, I think family fun, excuse me, I think family, fun, celebration, and freedom. There's a lot going on in the world right now. I ask that you please don't put a limit on when we can use fireworks. Allow us to continue to be responsible residents. My apologies for being unable to attend in person. Thank you for your time. Yesenia Lamb. Next one's from Eric Grenzman. Good afternoon, my, Eric, my name is Eric and I live in Gig Harbor and Harbor Crossing with my wife and two children. I support transitioning fireworks from four days to one day. A single day is still allowed for ample time to enjoy fireworks and celebrate our heritage without the ex extensive disruption of our sleep and neighborhood peace that four days creates. Thank you. Next one's from Paul Beatty. I support one day fireworks works in Gig Harbor. And his address is listed as 10823 64th Avenue Court, Northwest Gig Harbor. Next one's from Dale Schultz. 4207 31st Avenue Court. I support one day, July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. The next one's from Don and Barbara Pearson, 4493 Copper Court. We support one day, July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. The health and well being of pets and people is paramount. One day of random fireworks is sufficient celebration. Next one is from Tom Walsh, Henderson Bay, 10909. 63rd Avenue Northwest. My choice of one day only for fireworks displays in Gig Harbor. Thank you, Tom Walsh. Next one's from Turi Janes of 1102 136th Street Northwest. I support one day July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. Please consider our veterans who suffer from PTSD as well as countless children and animals who are frightened by these random explosions. Next one's from Lynn Bouquet from 8208 77th Street Court, Northwest Gig Harbor. I support one day July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. Fireworks can be traumatizing for people and animals. Our dogs tremble and hide when they start. Forget about taking them outside to potty. They stay anxious for a while after that because they don't know if it will start again. As I stated, I support fireworks in July or only in Gig Harbor. Thank you. Next one's from Paris Atkins, 3139 Anne Marie Court, Gig Harbor. I support one day July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. I, I would prefer to use the fireworks, excuse me, I would prefer to see the use of fireworks eliminated from our community except and permitted in organized events. The risk of fire in forested areas, e.g. Soundview and Grandview Forest Parks and around homes not be ignored. And one of the lessons we should have learned from this pandemic is to listen to the experts. Reducing that risk from multiple days to one day is a step in the right direction. Harris Atkins, 3139, Anne Marie Court. Next one is from Michelle Cubes and Bruce Winhold, 10981 Echo Rock Place. We support one day, July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. Fireworks are a real problem in Gig Harbor. They actually start a couple of weeks before July 4th and a week or two after intermittently. It is very stressful for many people and most dogs who are sensitive to sounds of sudden explosion. Why should people who suffer from anxiety or PTSD and those who care for them be put through this every year for many days in addition to July 4th? Why do we put our pets and animals through this? Why do we put wildlife through this? And then there's the extreme fire risk at that time of year. Our dog hides and trembles every time she hears a firework and is 
and is afraid to go outside during the July 4th holiday, which is not a holiday for all those affected by incessant fireworks. One day is enough. Thank you. The next one is from Susan Gary Elston, 6269 Harbor Sunset Lane. My husband and I will be unable to attend the council meeting on Monday, April 26th. We previously wrote individual emails that were sent to Jenny Wook expressing our choice for the number of days for fireworks. Our preference would be for zero days of fireworks, but since this is not an option, we go for one day of noise and explosions. I read in an email from Robin Denson that people who appear on Zoom have a much greater impact on the council's decision than those who take the time to write an email. It should not matter how one responds, what matters is that you care enough to respond. Thank you for recording our two votes for one day of fireworks. Mayor, that concludes the ones I have. I'll ask Molly to continue with what she has now. Okay. My next one is from Eric Anderson. My name is Eric Anderson and I live in Artendale. I am writing to support the proposed ban of fireworks in Gig Harbor outside of July 4th. I support anything that limits fireworks of any kind by unlicensed and untrained private citizens. I have many reasons to oppose fireworks altogether and in no particular order, I will list them. I am an anesthesiologist who works at TG as part of the acute trauma team. And I have seen firsthand the physical damage that can be done to the human body by today's unbelievably dangerous fireworks. I am a veteran of the Iraq war with time spent in Al-Assad and Ramadi in 2007. Not only do I have PTSD from the frequent bombings and the way they feel when you hear and feel the shock, I also have plenty of horrible memories of taking care of kids and adults that were blown up in one way or another. I personally like to take care of less blast injuries in my career. From 2009 to 2019, I had a next door neighbor who insisted on fireworks that were stretched over as many days as they felt like around the 4th and sometimes at New Year's. I can't tell you how many times we've had fireworks land on our roof, in our woods, or in our yard. At times, it was like the aftermath of a ticker tape parade. I still regularly find plastic debris from those fireworks. I know that many people choose to shoot the fireworks over the water, thus negating any need for cleanup. Really? Where do these people think the debris goes? Several years ago, a house not far from mine in Whitley Hills burned to the ground as a result of fireworks igniting its cedar roof. I have two dogs that every year I have to sedate into a oblivion in order to get them through the hours, the hours long barrage of explosions happening feet from my house. Additionally, I have had wild animals on my property turn up dead the day after neighbors use the fireworks. I support anything that will mitigate the legality or use of these dangerous and damaging fireworks. July 4th is only, it, July 4th only use is a step in the right direction. As to the argument that it limits freedom on the very day we are to be celebrating it, I say that celebrating freedom is valid and appropriate and reasonable. And it should be done in a way that does not take away the public freedom from fear of injury, property damage, animal safety, wild and domestic, and respect for our war veterans. Have a city fireworks display that's done safely, professionally, and quickly. Eric Anderson. Marty Beak. I support one day July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. In reality, my husband and I strongly support no fireworks at all. My husband is a Vietnam veteran. I also have experienced the feelings of many other family and friends who are war veterans who do not feel honored and appreciated by people setting off fireworks. In fact, it is the opposite. It does not feel patriotic or respectful to have our neighborhoods subjected to loud booming noises, fire danger and injury. It is time to change. We live in a time when fire danger has increased tremendously. How is it acceptable to allow people to play with shooting off flammable and explosive items that endanger not only themselves, but others. Fireworks companies have found a comfortable marketing niche at the expense of the safety and well being of the public, as well as the environment and wildlife. It is time to find a better way to support our youth and community groups that have come to depend on the income from selling fireworks. What kind of message are we giving our youth? We are growing increasing, increasingly densely populated and wildlife is more stressed than ever. 
Many of those I know with pets find that their only alternative is to leave their home during the fourth holiday days to find peace. There's so many reasons to honor our country and its veterans in a better way. Respectfully submitted, Marty Beek, Woodworth Avenue. Mr. Capes, William Capes. I support the city maintaining the four day period of fireworks. Also, I support additional days of permitted firework sales. Firework sales are an important fundraiser for many of our community groups, including organizations such as youth soccer and youth music programs. Thank you, William Capes, 92nd Avenue, Court Northwest. Charles, Car Charles Carlson, I support four days of fireworks for the independent celebration. We have lived under severe restriction for 18 months and I support allowing citizens to enjoy celebrating our special day for as long as possible. By the way, I'm a senior citizen, not some kid who wants to waste as much of his dad's money as possible. Let's our citizens enjoy a good time after being locked down with no school, no socializing, masking, etc. Charles Carlson, Harborview Drive. Doug Sorensen, Mayor Kuhn and city council members. I support one day July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. In addition, I support the enforcement of not allowing illegal fireworks in the city of Gig Harbor. Thank you, Doug Sorensen, North Harborview Drive. And last, Jeanette Sorensen. I support one day July 4th only for fireworks in Gig Harbor. I also feel that the sales of fireworks would have a minimum, oh, excuse me, a maximum of three days, July 2nd through the 4th. Jeanette Sorensen, North Harborview Drive. And that concludes the written comments. Okay, thank you. I will now open up for callers. Uh, Robert Wood had um, been on earlier trying at the wrong, uh, wrong time. So I will start with Robert Wood and then it will be Nan Nancy Webster and then um, Dave Higby. So Robert Wood, you've got three minutes um, or less to state your name and address and your opinion. Uh, my name is Robert Wood. I live at 2709 43rd Street here in Gig Harbor. Um, I am in favor of limiting the fireworks to one day for all of the aforementioned reasons. Um, it is terribly intrusive, upsetting for kids and pets, um, people losing sleep. Um, there's a great deal of personal danger and fire danger. I just think that this is an irresponsible way to celebrate the birth of our country. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being patient. Uh, Nancy Webster. Uh, your microphone is turned off. Uh oh, sorry. There you are. Hey, we get to see a caller. We haven't. We I don't think we've ever seen a caller. So. <laughs> and you're frozen. We'll give you a chance. Uh, Nancy. Wait. There you can, go. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, thank you. I. At the, I don't want to cover everything that's already been covered. Um, I am somewhat sympathetic to those who feel like change is being pushed on them. I understand that. Oh, and by the way, my, my comments didn't get read, so I'm not sure what happened to them. Um, I, I am the spouse of a, a combat veteran, retired military, so I am keenly aware of uh, what PTS do, PTSD can do to people. And um, I, th I think that those who want to keep things the same need to understand it's just, it's beyond them. It's way beyond their own needs. Um, the young children, I hadn't thought about the autistic children. I should because I have an autistic grandson. Um, pets, we have pets too, and they're cowering in the closet for four days. Uh, and then, of course, we've got trees, uh, Mr. Abersold, that were cut down behind the firing range that are dying there. Uh, and I find that to be a concern where fireworks are concerned. Um, so I, I recommend that Gig Harbor pass uh, not only, well, just one day of fireworks to celebrate for a limited period of time. And it would be even better if they would designate pre-approved areas to set them off where we don't have um, trees and, and homes and all. 
uh, that might be hard to do, but thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you. And now it would be uh, Dave Hig Higby, and then it would be Randy C. Go ahead, Dave. Hi, Mayor Kuhn and Council. Can you hear me? Yes, yes they can. Very good. Uh, my name is David Higby. My wife, Sheila, and I live at 9527 Crescent Cove Place in Gig Harbor. We just want to say that um, we support eliminating completely uh, fireworks uh, in Gig Harbor or if need be, limiting fireworks uh, sales and discharge in Gig Harbor to July 4th only. Thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight and good night. And thank you for your patience. It would be uh, Randy C and then Brenda and Angela. Go ahead, Randy. Thank you city council for the opportunity tonight. Um, changing the dates limits families and individual freedom to express their gratitude and from celebrating the birth of our country. For those families that work, that have to work on the 4th of July, this would stop them from being able to legally celebrate the 4th. For those that work shift work, they might work both Saturday and Sunday. So for them, they would be able to celebrate on Thursday and Friday. If this changes, they don't get to celebrate. That's what we're forgetting is for those people that have to work, on, on the 4th of July, they don't get to celebrate. The families you're talking about are affecting our police officers, firefighters, hospital workers, EMTs, not to mention those that work in the service industries who work long weekends. As it is now, there is plenty of time for those individuals to get a free day to be able to lawfully celebrate the 4th. And I want to reiterate lawfully, the legal days of fireworks discharge in the state of Washington is noon on the 28th of June through 11 p.m. on the 5th of July and also the 31st of December. Everything else is illegal. My question is, did anyone from the city council or staff talk with the city of Tacoma on how their ban is going? I understand that we are not discussing a ban tonight, but it might be helpful to know that the city put up a drone two years ago to see how their ban on fireworks was going. What they found was that there was even more fireworks being discharged within the city limits than before the ban. This change in the ordinance will not create the change that you seek. As of 2020, the population of Gig Harbor was 11,343. As you stated earlier, 240 emails came in and roughly 203 of those were in favor of this change, which is 1.7% of the Gig Harbor population. You could say that that's a higher percentage of the population that wants to keep things the same, but I would disagree. The heavy majority of people just want to be left alone. They wanna live their lives and let everyone else just live their lives. I would pose that if you put this to a popular vote, that would, it would not pass. Fireworks should be bringing people together, not pushing them apart. This holiday is the one holiday of the year where people from all races and religion can come together and celebrate our amazing country that has provided us with so many freedoms and blessings. The decision to approve this change would limit those people of, of this city even more than what the state has already done. I would ask that the council leave things as they are for the betterment of the community of Gig Harbor. Thank you for your time. Um, excuse me, Randy, would you please uh, give me your last name and your address? Uh, my name is Randy Curley and I am the area manager for TNT Fireworks. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have uh, Brenda Likens. Go ahead. Brenda, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go okay. ahead. Hi, um, my name is Brenda Likens. I live at 11610 Arrowhead Drive in Gig Harbor. Um, I am a nurse practitioner, board certified. I work for University of Washington Medicine, pediatric medicine. And I just like to say I, I support anything that limits the use of fireworks. Um, I work in healthcare and I can tell you um, the effects on children who are autistic as well as pets, the injuries that occur. The injuries that occur are 50% in children 19 and below. 
the American Academy of Pediatrics supports no use of fireworks for families. And I'm in agreement with my institution. And medicating a dog or a child for one day, that's understandable. But medicating a dog or a child for four days is unreasonable. I am one of those essential workers who often does work on the 4th of July. And, you do, and I even do occasionally 24 hour shifts and I am fine with missing fireworks. And most people do not work 24 hours and they're able to take a part of that day to celebrate, limiting to one day 100% in agreement with. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now it will, I will go to Angela Sisney and then Michael Davis and John Harrington. Go ahead, Angela. Can you hear me now? We can. Okay, great. Thanks for the time. Um, I'm speaking in support of limiting you, fireworks. Uh, can you put your, uh, Nate, say your address and hold Oh, I am so sorry. Um, it's Angela Sisney, 8026 Goodman Drive, Gig Harbor. So I'm speaking in support of limiting fireworks to July 4th. Um, I really hate that week. I spend that week medicating and consoling my pets, doing volunteer work relating to lost pets and getting very little sleep because people ignore the law and set fireworks off after 11 p.m. And around me, uh, most of them are illegal. I live right on the harbor in East Gig Harbor directly across from downtown and the sounds of the explosions from the city limits travels far, notwithstanding the council members comments before uh, that were made before about the ordinance in this in this um, the city ordinance not affecting people outside um, in the county, um, it does. The, the sounds of the explosions travel, and embers travel as well. Um, and notwithstanding what was said about fireworks not causing fires, things do catch on fire. We have the singe and burn marks to prove it, and we hose things down all that week to try and keep things from catching on fire. And finally, every year during that week, I personally reflect on the year when I was in elementary school and my clothes caught fire from a Roman candle and I had third degree burns, which was very a painful and traumatic experience. So in my viewpoint, fireworks are dangerous and a nuisance and um, they, we should limit them as much as possible. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Angela. Michael Davis. Go ahead, uh, please state your name and your address. Uh, we can't hear you yet. Your microphone says it's off. And now you put your hand down, which is... There. Okay, go ahead, Michael Davis. Okay, go ahead, Michael Davis. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, uh, Mike Davis, address is 11611 Arrowhead Drive. Uh, I wanted to speak in support of having fireworks on one day on 4th July and 4th July only. Uh, I work as a, as a firefighter in a uh, very large city, uh, not too far from here. Uh, and I go on, if I work on 4th July, I know I'm going to a house fire. I'm no, I know that I'm going to brush fires. I know that I'm gonna go to all the accessory fires that are that are related to fireworks. Not to mention a couple of trauma calls that involve burns, um, uh, projectiles, uh, things of that nature from Roman candles and things like that. Uh, fireworks that have been abused. Um, so. What I'd like is to have it uh, one day. Uh, it's it's a life safety issue. You're putting firefighters at risk when they have to go into burning buildings. There's some of these rubbish fires. There's propane tanks. Nothing that I can catch. Um, it's a safety issue for the kids that are lighting off these fireworks. Um, and hey, just on my street alone on Arrowhead Drive last year, there was uh, groups of people sitting out on the sidewalk lighting off bottle rockets. I Saw about three myself land in somebody's roof across the street. Um, very little regard for people's property, the trash, uh, all the pickup that happens afterwards or doesn't happen afterwards, as you said, I should say. It's just a whole lot of uh, whole lot of noise and a whole lot of mess, and it doesn't seem like it's uh, should be very necessary. Uh, so I just want to say that I want it down to uh, one day. Uh, the other piece is the, uh, the veterans that live in town. Uh, I know there's a sizable veteran population uh, and combat veterans specific. And I know uh, myself included, I, I don't appreciate the loud noises. And uh, it's not uh, it's not respecting anybody, anybody by doing that. And, uh, you know, some days I got to work on 4th July as well. Um, 
it's not too big of a deal if I don't get, I don't get the light off fireworks. So that to me seems kind of like a, a mood point. Uh, so anyway, thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, I hope you go down in one day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Harrington. Go ahead, John. Please say your, your name and your address and proceed. John, uh, we've got your... There we go. Is that better? Yes. Okay, thank you. My name is John Harrington. I live at 6740 Soundview Drive. So I overlook the, uh, the Narrows and all of the fireworks that go up during that, that particular time period. And I'm, I speak uh, in favor of the limitation on fireworks. And I do so out of a sense of guilt. I think all the arguments that I heard were, were terrific and right on point about limiting fireworks. But as a kid, I, uh, I did more than my share of damage and I had a great deal of fun, but I was a kid. I was thinking like a kid. Like a kid, I'm only concerned with myself and what I want. And so it's about me. Well, I think we need to think a little bit beyond that kind of thinking, the me thinking, and into the sense of what this, what fireworks do to other people, the pets, etc. I think those points have been made. I'd also like to say one more thing about kids. I'm, I'm less worried about you know, the, the police chief going after kids who are setting off a few firecrackers. I have to say that's, we've all done that and we, we know kid play. But right in front of me are all sorts of people who set off enormous, powerful fireworkers. And it's, my poor dog suffers enormously like other dogs around here. But I think those people, not the kids, not the kids, I'm not especially worried about them. But these people that set off every night after night, big fireworks, I would like to see those limited. Thank you. Thank you. And now it will be Pamela Carter and then Renai Nung. Go ahead, Pamela. And Pamela, if you can state your name and your address, go ahead. Uh, maybe try to get your mute button off. Hello? Yeah, there Is you go. Work? Okay, great. Technology is a wonderful thing. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of my wife, Pamela. We both live at uh, 4003 35th Avenue Court Northwest in Gig Harbor. Um, and I want to thank the council for the opportunity to comment. Several of the other comments have mentioned freedom and rights. And I'd like to point out that we have rights, but we also have responsibilities to our fellow citizens. And there is no constitutional right to set off explosives that endanger people's lives and property and disturb the peace. Uh, several comments have mentioned the tradition of celebrating the 4th of July. When I grew up in, in Ohio in the 50s and 60s, the 4th of July was a big event and worthy of celebration. But we celebrated on the 4th of July, not the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And I can't, I disagree with the assumption by the uh, area manager of TNT Fireworks that you can't celebrate without setting off explosives. You can celebrate the 4th of July and our heritage in ways other than endangering your fellow citizens. Um, also, I'd like to uh, uh, say that I agree with Council Member Heim's suggestion about education. I, I doubt that anybody knows you could get hit with a thousand dollar fine if you set off fireworks illegally. Perhaps if the city were to publicize that in advance, some people would be deterred. And deterrence is often a better uh, use of uh, our time than enforcement. I know it'll be hard for the police chief to enforce this, but if people know that they could get hit with a thousand dollar fine, maybe they wouldn't set off the fireworks in the first place. I doubt that anybody from the Ukraine bothered to comment on a, a uh, um, Gig Harbor uh, proposal. Uh, and for, if there's only been one out of six, one incident in six years, I think we've been incredibly fortunate. Um, I suspect that this really isn't so much about freedom or rights or tradition as it is about the amount of revenue that TNT Fireworks and their associates can generate. Uh, I'm glad to know that some of the revenue goes for worthy causes like in college and paying for soccer programs. 
but there has to be a better way to support those programs than allowing people to endanger their neighbors. So uh, I strongly urge the council to um, support the, uh, to vote in favor of the uh, limiting of fireworks to July the 4th only. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. And uh, the next caller is Renai. Please state your name and your address. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rini Ng. Sorry. And I, thank you. I know it's not easy, Mayor. Um, and I live at 11007 66th Avenue Court Northwest in Gig Harbor. And I have to echo everything that everyone has said about having fireworks for just July 4th. And I, I'm not gonna say any more than that, except that this is the first time in my life that I have gone to a council meeting or anything with a local government, because I feel that strongly about limiting the fireworks. It's almost abusive. It's not celebration. It's an abuse of the noise, and um, and my poor my poor animals are just suffering. So, um, if you just realize how important it is to many of us, it's so important to me in, in that I have stepped forward today, and I thank you very very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next one is Jasmine Myers, and then it'll be Nancy Webster and uh, uh, Mr. Hicks. Go ahead, Jasmine. Hi, Mayor and everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you. Thanks for letting me speak. Um, I want to just reiterate what everyone has shared as oh, well. You, sorry, could you say your address? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Jasmine Myers, 10540 Sentinel Drive. Um, but I want to reiterate everything that has been shared um, by those who have um, emailed and also um, spoke tonight um, to limit the fireworks to just one day. I live in Harbor Hill. Um, we're a very um, compacted community and the amount and types of fireworks that are lit off here um, multiple days in a row is very concerning to our family and multiple neighbors. Um, we have lots of veterans in our community and throughout Gig Harbor, um, as well as pets. And it, like others have shared, I feel that it's cruel to pets and to uh, the elderly. My grandmother um, has Alzheimer's and lives in Heron's Key, which is close by. And um, she doesn't have the ability to turn up loud music or to leave her home for the, those few days. Um, and she struggles with relaxing and being able to fall asleep and it's concerning, scary for her. Um, we struggle with our dog, just like everyone else has shared. And the amount of air pollution and um, debris that's left um, on our streets going into our storm drains um, that some people go out and pick up and pick up for other people, I think, um, is just something that could be limited to one day. And I would vote for zero days if I could. I'd love that the city put on a big, beautiful show for everyone to enjoy and to celebrate. Um, but I definitely am voting for the um, one day only. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, I believe it's Tom Hick is the next H74. Am I right? Please say, I uh, call her. One two five three eight seven four. Please state your name and address. You have three minutes. Yes, Mayor King, members of the City Council, can you guys hear me okay? Can you speak up a little louder? Um, is this better? Yes. Can you can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mayor King, this is uh, Tom Wick, uh, just outside city limits, as you know. Um, you know, I was listening to a lot of the comments and I, I kind of consider myself a problem solver and I have a solution that I think would probably bridge the gap for everybody. So what I heard a lot of people saying is, hey, it's the 4th of July, it's a very important holiday, it's America, it's Independence Day, and any restrictions on that would be anti-American. Then I also hear a lot of public comment talking about, hey, for, you know, fires, um, injuries, and wildlife, 
you know, the adverse impacts to wildlife, pets, animals, which I totally agree with. No question, no, no questions asked. Because I, my wife and I have a, we adopted an elderly horse that's pushing 30 years old, and we have dire concerns for her during these, you know, these holiday periods, um, Fourth of July, um, New Year's. So I was thinking. What would be a compromise? What would the citizens of Big Harbor say, hey, this sounds reasonable? And a lot of municipalities do this. But what if the city of Big Harbor, two days consecutively, 4th of July, maybe the 5th of July, or the 3rd and the 4th, they do the most spectacular um, fireworks display over the harbor. And the city pays for it. And... So that addresses a lot of concerns. Yeah. It's a controlled scenario. You know, people that are experienced and trained are lighting off these fireworks. And of course, you know, the city can make sure they're not dropping them on top of boats and houses and, you know, starting fires. And those people that have to work on the night of the 4th, or, you know, they could, you know, maybe participate or come and join on the 3rd or the 5th. And so I was just thinking about that going, a lot of municipalities do that. And I was thinking of what would be a reasonable compromise and that would do it because it acknowledges the 4th of July and the importance of it. It acknowledges the safety issues. And I think it would be a reasonable compromise. So that's what I would like to leave as my public comment. And I thank you very much for giving it consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Francis Walker, please state your name and address and go ahead. Uh, Francis Walker, I live at 7806 Scansy Avenue here in Gig Harbor. And thank you so much for letting me speak. I agree with all of the people before me who have spoken against fireworks. I am completely opposed to them. But I just wanted to bring out the fact that um, how fireworks are made the raw materials that come from fireworks, that are the composed fireworks, are mined from mountains, and which is very uh, destructive to the forests, to the wildlife that live there. Plus the little uh, particles that float down to earth after the fireworks have exploded are toxic, and those chemicals lay on the ground and in the water, and they do not degrade. So again, very dangerous for the uh, wildlife and, and for us as well. And uh, just an interesting fact is that there are two states, Delaware and Massachusetts, which have completely banned all consumer fireworks in the states, which I think is kind of interesting. And um, I don't know if I have the authority to speak on this, but I'd certainly be in favor of the $1,000 violation penalty. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other callers that um, would like to raise their hand on this subject? Uh, John Johnson, go ahead. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is John Johnson. I am one of the assistant chiefs here at Gig Harbor Fire. And over the course of uh, two evenings, the last meeting and this meeting, um, I've sat and listened to everyone's comment. Um, I've offered my own input uh, to the situation. And I would just say that um, in the course of the last five years, um, within the city limits, I've been able to limit that down. We've responded to three verified fireworks related incidents, um, a grass fire, uh, two grass fires and a, a straw bale fire last year. Um, that's not accounting for the, the incidents where we respond to, we do something quickly and we don't even try and investigate it. Uh, the 4th of July is a busy, uh, day and night. And, and honestly, the few days around the 4th of July is very busy for the fire department. Um, we have an increase in call volume uh, from uh, smaller fires, beauty bark fires, these type of things. Within the city limits of Gig Harbor, we have not had a catastrophic loss of a structure. But within the fire district, we have had incidents of catastrophic loss of fireworks from fire or houses from fireworks. Um, that's not saying that it won't happen in Gig Harbor. Um, I'm just trying to report those, those facts. So 
what it comes down to is the Gig Harbor Fire Department would very much back uh, the limiting of fireworks discharge to one day. And we would very much partner with uh, getting that message out to the citizens uh, because we serve the city of Gig Harbor as well as unincorporated Pierce County. So thank you for letting me speak tonight and have a good evening. Thank you. And uh, James Likens, go ahead. Yeah, please state your name and address and go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is Jim Likens, uh, 11610 Arrowhead Drive. And I almost took my hand down after the um, person before me spoke eloquently about being in the trenches for the 4th of July and what this entails. And I think pretty much said it all. I just wanted to reiterate something that with uh, being a pet owner, that the busiest day for shelters for dogs in the United States of America is on July 5th. I think it's pretty easy to figure out why that is, why dogs run away from home and so forth. Like my wife said earlier, as uh, you know, on, on uh, staff at University of Washington, the American Academy of Pediatrics does not endorse firework usage at all. Um, they would like to see it go away. One day is more than enough. I personally would like to see it go away completely, but I'm willing to give one day. I can medicate my dog for one day. I can work with my child for one day, but there's no reason for us to have to endure this for four days everything that goes with it, the police have the ability within their discretion to not write, write a ticket for $1,000 for a kid with a sparkler because they're not the problem. But they can write the ticket for someone who's putting off a cannon, um, a big Roman candle, or a huge aerial display. That is within their discretion. Let them do their job, let them do it properly, and let us just have some peace around the 4th of July. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other callers that wish to raise their hand? Okay, I will close the public comment. Um, I would ju just like to say that I, um, I, I hope council votes for this ordinance. Um, I would like it to be one day. Um, I don't want displays over the harbor either in the future. We have a very small harbor and I, I swim in the sound a lot and I don't swim any time around this. Um, uh, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot more people in the world than there used to be. And the noise and the fireworks are really, really loud. I have to medicate my dog. I've seen houses burn down. The pollution is horrendous. And so much of it goes into the sound and people don't even think about it. And there is no, uh, there is not a lot of respect for other people. Um, it goes up in the air. You don't know who caused your, your house to burn down. So. I really, I, and I really hope it doesn't ramp up by approving this ordinance, but I really hope council does limit this to one day. It's, it's uh, gotten out of hand. And it was interesting to hear about how it's mined and all about the, the shelters being so crowded the next day. So I hope council does limit this. Uh, with that, I will open up to a discussion. Uh, council member Wu. Uh, yes, thank you. And, and thanks to everyone who sent in emails and who spoke this evening. The purpose, the proposed fireworks ordinance came about because of citizens' complaints. And the main reason is always the harmful effects of PTSD. The citizen, the city sent out a request for comments on tonight's proposal of one day, July 4th, for fireworks. And as we heard tonight, 85% of the respondents support one day or less. Only 11% were in favor of keeping four days. 85% responded in favor of one day or less. So as to not affect our nonprofits, this proposed ordinance, the hours available to sell fireworks stay the same. I contacted various Pierce County cities and the council has this report. All the contacted cities report since initiating firework reductions that less fireworks and less complaints from citizens. University Place says since fireworks were reduced, citizen complaints are greatly reduced. Since Edgewood changed to July 4th, only less fireworks and less complaints from citizens. The police chiefs from Sumner by allowing the lawful use on the fourth only 
Most residents respect and follow it. What about enforcement? Most cities do lots of education. Before the fourth, the mayor of Edgewood goes out and he visits previous offenders and has a little chat with them. The Shel Shelton city manager where fireworks are banned says, quote, we approach the issue from an education standpoint and don't pursue enforcement unless it's a repeat offender and that rarely, if ever happens. We haven't had an enforcement action in the three years I've been in Shelton. That's from the Shelton city manager. The police chief from Sumner says, by allowing the lawful use on the fourth, most residents respect and follow it. The chief goes on to say, a violation of our code is a civil infraction, but few, if any, get issued. Gig Harbor sent a survey to our citizens asking if they want July 4th only or stay with the four days. Loudly and clearly, 85% respondents said one day, July 4th. One of our emails today stated, I am a retired educator who has witnessed firsthand the fear in autistic individuals who cannot calm themselves after hearing fireworks, unquote. I value the overwhelming voice of our citizens and I will listen to them. I move to adopt ordinance number 1460 as presented. Thank you, council member Franich. Second. Oh, sorry, that was a motion. <laughs> I, I was, it was, I, I couldn't know when it was gonna stop. So it was a motion. Okay, it was a second and thank you. <laughs> uh, council member Franich. Thank you, Mayor. Well, you know, I've, I am a, I'm a big fireworks guy. I've been a fireworks guy my whole life. I've had more Roman candle fights than council member Abersall ever thought about having. <laughs> um, and I, on the other hand, I do believe, as I said at the last meeting, if I had a thousand people that testified that I want, we want 10 story buildings or five story buildings in downtown Gig Harbor, I, I wouldn't support it. I don't care how many people would come because I don't personally think it's right for the character of Gig Harbor. This is a little bit different issue. This does not have anything to do with affecting the character of the view basin, overdevelopment of uh, small lots. So I, I do think it is important that, that we take to heart the, the people that have testified tonight and that have sent us all of the emails. Um, I, you know, the, we could go back and forth with the anecdotal. I I've know a lot of, uh, especially Vietnam veterans that I've talked to about this and they say, that is why we went to war to maintain our freedoms. And I see this as a freedom issue, but I also think that it's important to listen to the citizens that took the time to, to testify. And I do, I, I can empathize with the problems with the PTSD and the pets that suffer through this. <clears throat> but um, I would like to, I, I, the problem for me with limited to one day is when this falls in the middle of the week, People usually don't have, if they have to go to work the next day, it's on a Wednesday, they're not gonna have their celebration until the weekend. So I, I would like to amend the motion to allow fireworks on the 4th of July and the Saturdays that precede the 4th of July. I second that amendment. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, there's a, there's an amendment on the floor and there's a second to limit it to the 4th of July and uh, the Saturday following. Is that correct, Council Member Franich? That is correct. I, I, I don't want to make uh, criminals out of people that don't have the ability to celebrate the 4th that falls in the middle of the week. Okay. So I think it's the least we could do. All right. Um, discussion or discussion on the amendment 
Uh, go ahead, Councilmember Hines. Mayor, Mayor Kuhn, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can we uh, confirm Councilmember Franch's amendment? First, he said it was the Saturday before. Now you clarified it as the Saturday after, which might fall out of state law guidelines. Can you clarify that? Yeah, Councilmember Franch. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I meant the Saturday after. And until so you just mentioned that, I hadn't thought about whether that falls out of the state regulations. Yeah, it would only work if it's the Saturday prior. Saturday prior. Well, that Saturday. Mr. Rice, maybe you can weigh in here too, but I think I have that right. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do the math, to be honest with you, counting backwards to the 28th. I think, I think that would work. It's the 28th and then the uh, right. noon to 11 p.m., 29th through the 3rd, uh, 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., and then the fourth, 9 a.m. to midnight is the state law allowance. Right. So, so it would yes, be the work. Saturday prior to the fourth. Okay. Then I would I would change my language to the Saturday prior to the fourth of July. Okay. And as Still we get okay, uh, there's a second. As we go through a couple more comments, uh, someone get their calendar out there and just make sure it doesn't exclude one year or at least for the next five or 10 years. Uh, Council Member Himes. Uh, yes, finally. Uh, anticipating some great discussion on this item, uh, I'm gonna ask for about a five minute break, seeing how it's 8.06 by my clock right now. Is that why you were waving your hands up and down? <laughs> well, no, I was actually skipped over twice, okay? Uh, I had my hand up before uh, Council Member Wook. I had my hand up before Council Member Greenwich, and all I want to oh. do is use the restroom. So, anyway. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't see it. So, okay, if there's no objection, don't let it happen again. Okay, we will take roughly a eight eight minute break. This City Council meeting of, of um, April 26th is back in session at 8:16. We will go on with council comments on the fireworks. Uh, council member Dinson. Yes, thank you, mayor. And a huge thanks to council member Himes. You are my hero because I had three glasses of water. <laughs> and I was definitely ready for a break. <laughs> so thanks for that. Um, as far as this amendment goes, I wanna say that I really appreciate the effort at compromise. I really do. But given the hundreds of heartfelt testimonies we received from our citizens to protect them, <clears throat> protect their animals, protect their property, I just feel like recognizing the 4th of July on the 4th of July is the right thing to do and that we can't justify having another night of, of fireworks. I mean, the fact is that I understand the concerns of people wanting to celebrate on a weekend, but there's people who work seven days a week and on all different days, our first responders, our healthcare workers, our grocery workers, our restaurant workers, you know, holidays are always gonna fall on a day that's, that's, not in, that's not convenient for everybody. And given the testimony, I mean, the 4th of July is the date of the recognized holiday. And given the concerns that folks have, I just don't feel like we can justify doubling the risk that people are are feeling doubling the trauma that people are experiencing from the fireworks to a second day so i will be voting against this amendment okay uh council member hines you're on um, mute okay there we go um yes relative to this amendment i think what we have heard tonight was um, a considerable number of citizens uh, speaking on the other end of the spectrum. That is, instead of compromising, let's add another day, I heard the word ban multiple times saying, hey, don't, don't, don't just limit to one day, get rid of the doggone thing. So I think any movement toward let's go open the thing back up would obviously be in the wrong direction. So I'm definitely going to vote against this amendment. Uh, Daniel, did you have some insight for us? Uh, sorry, I just wanted to ask one clarifying question for Council Member Franich, just so that I understood the, the amendment real quick. And I think I'm do, doing the math right. I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. But um, if, if June has 30 days and the 4th of July is a Saturday, I think you could actually 
hit the Saturday before as well, if you say plus the prior Saturday, was your intention to, to have it no matter what the Saturday before or only if it is uh, uh, like a midweek so that you give the opportunity? I, I, don't, I don't mind either way. I just want to make sure that you could have two Saturdays, I think, because it's seven days apart from the 28th to the 4th. Well, I, uh, I hadn't done uh, the math for that degree uh, either. So um, I, I'm just trying to uh, not uh, turn people into criminals that uh, are, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what the case is there um, as far as what you just said, as far as the calendar works. Yeah, dur during the break, I was kind of thinking in my head too. So uh, I, I think if, it, because, because the 28th um, is, is seven days before the fourth, I think you could, if it is just allowed for the Saturday before run into a scenario where you allow both days. And I just didn't know if that was your intent or not. Well, no, I, I mean, and, and I would go so far as to say that if the, if the, if the 4th of July does fall on a Saturday, then it could only be one day, but you know, I don't know, start trying to craft the, these words where, you know, we're, we're trying to get to every nuance that could possibly happen. I don't know how practical that is. Um, so uh, I think I'll, I don't know where this is going to go really with the vote anyway, but um, I, you know, I, and as I said earlier, this just, I really do think it's important that we listen to the people that take the time to, to comment. But uh, as one gentleman brought up, you know, I, I, I believe that there's been a, um, you know, a pretty concerted effort by some to, to bring this to the forefront. And, uh, you know, really the actual number of people of, when you talk about a 180 emails in relation to 10,000 people, it's, it's a very small percentage. But anyway, that's a side note. Council Member Wook. Yes, um, I'm going to agree with Council Member Himes in so much as you bet what we heard was one day and really we'd like to ban it. So, uh, so I'm not going to be supporting this amendment. Okay. Let's wrap this up. Council Member Rodenberg. Yes. Well, what we what we did here was from less than 2% of the people that reside in Geek Harbor. So uh, I am going to support the amendment. And I think if the wording was, uh, the amendment wording was, unless the 4th of July falls on a Saturday, then the prior Saturday would be allowed. I'd also like to, for those that say we haven't heard, we've only heard from a small percentage of the total citizens. Um, that's the case in most situations. So uh, we don't hear from a lot. So if you think of how many people we have heard, it's, it's a hot topic. It's a very hot topic. And it's, it's as big as most of the things that we have that are very con uh, contested. So it's always gonna be a small amount in, in a way. And if you send out the, a, a call for action to selected people, then yeah, you are going to get a skewed results. So if you send out a call, uh, the people that are interested in that will vote for it. So it, it's not like it was a vote on the ballot. Okay, so there's amendment um, on the on the ordinance uh, to amend it to the Saturday prior to the 4th. I'm gonna do a roll call. Those in favor of the amendment, uh, say aye, Council Member Wook. Nay. Council Member Jensen. No. Council Member Rodenberg. Yes. Council Member Franich. Yes. Council Member Himes. No. Council Member Markley. Yes. Council member Aversold. Nay. Okay. okay. Uh, we'll go to the original amendment. I mean, original motion. Council member, uh, before we vote, we'll see if there's any more um, deliberating 
Uh, Council Member Franich. I'd like to propose another amendment. I would like the, the this the civil infraction portion of this to go back to the finance and safety co committee reading for um, further discussion on the amount of the infraction. I don't think you, you can just take as far as, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, you can just take, it stays this way until council votes otherwise. So you can just bring it up at a safety and finance committee uh, without, without having any action tonight. So you can just you can just bring it up at your finance safety and and He's spend the time that. that you want to. Okay, well, I'm not on that committee. That's okay. Um, just tell the who is uh, uh, Councilmember Wook is, aren't you? Yeah. So they can, as long as there's a support by someone at that committee, you can bring it up. So it looks like Councilmember Wook would be willing to support bringing it up. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So good. Uh, Council Member Hines. Uh, yes. Uh, going into now, I assume we're in discussions or deliberations on the motion that's still on the table. We are. Okay. Um, I guess I'd like to point out one other item here, and that is we, we've heard the, the statistical arguments called the 85% to 15% or 5% or whatever it is which is pretty convincing, but I think there's another argument that can be put forth. And that is, if you did, and we used to do them all the time, a risk or damages versus benefits analysis on this thing, irrespective of the numbers. I heard stuff like trauma. I heard things like uh, property damage. I heard pollution, potential injury. I go right down the line. And on the other side, all I heard was, it's my right. That's my right. And by the way, I agree with, with Council Member French. It was a great form of, let's face it, it was entertainment. What it was, it was entertainment, okay? In my neighborhood, nobody salutes the flag when a fireworks goes off, okay? Most people, yay, wow, there's a lot of all kinds of uh, celebration going on. It's fun, okay? But when you weigh that against all these other factors, and I'm going beyond the numbers now, just look at the factors. Like I said, emotional trauma, pet trauma, property damage, injury, pollution. Um, the only rational decision I think you can come to is, hey, uh, <laughs> this thing needs to be supported and ultimately, we probably will go to a ban, okay? This may be just the first step, but I think it's, uh, when, when you look at it that way and you look at the numbers, I don't think you can come to any other conclusion. Thank you. Councilmember Rodenberg. Yes, I wanted to ensure Councilman Franich that uh, I am the chairman of the Finance and Safety Committee, and we will address it at our next meeting. Uh, Council Member Denson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And, and I'll be brief because we've had such amazing testimony tonight. And we've had great comments from my fellow council members. Um, thank you all. Very, very good comments. I just wanted to briefly wrap up my thoughts that, you know, given the citizens' overwhelming response in favor of limiting fireworks to the fourth, this is just like council member Heim said, a no brainer decision for me. It's an issue that affects everyone in our community and the citizens have spoken loud and clear and asking us to protect themselves, their animals, their families, their property, the environment. Some issues came up tonight that I had not even considered. And I really appreciate, appreciate those comments. Um, there are reasons that fireworks are not allowed all the time in Washington, nor are they allowed all the time in other states. Those reasons include wildfires, property fires, injuries, and we've heard a lot about the impacts of noise on our residents and our animals and our wildlife. Um, having fireworks 
is such, as we've heard, it, it's the noise in particular, it makes such an impact on our residents and it impacts their ability to exercise their right of quiet enjoyment. The, the arguments on the other side, like Council Member Himes pointed out, has a lot to do with freedom and rights, but it's also important to protect the rights of those around us. And we have other ordinances in our city that protect those rights. We have a noise ordinance, for example, that says that you're welcome to play your music loud as you want at your property up until a certain point when it starts to impact others' enjoyment of their property rights as well. And then, then the city steps in. We even have specific ordinances in specific areas of town like Millville because we recognize how important it is to make sure that everyone has the right to quiet enjoyment of their property. Um, the question of enforcement has come up and fortunately we've heard from other communities around the state that report that enforcement for the most part is educational and I'm sure with our citizens it will be similar. We've heard from the Assistant Fire Chief um, John Johnson that he looks forward to working with our police department to helping to help promote education of our citizens and I mean, gosh, a lot of the communities that we heard from said that they hadn't issued a fine in years on this. And I certainly hope that that is the case as well. I think folks want to do the right thing. Our police do not have time to be driving around neighborhoods looking for kids with sparklers. I don't think that that's what they want to do or what the intent is of this ordinance. The police will be responding to complaints of disturbances. And that's what we're talking about. The bigger explosions of noise that people are concerned about. Either they can't sleep or they're concerned for their property or their animals or their children, as we have heard. And those are the kinds of serious infractions that we want we want our police to go check out and, and educate these folks about what the rules are and why we have those rules. And it's really all about the protection of our community and the respect for our community. And, and again, like one of the members um, or one of our citizens said tonight, it's about taking care of, of others and thinking of others um, beyond our own personal enjoyment. So as I said at the last council meeting, I feel like it's our first and foremost duty to preserve the health and safety and well-being of our citizens and their property and allowing dangerous and disruptive fireworks outside the recognized, nationally recognized holiday is to me just not justifiable. The risk isn't justifiable. And I will be voting to support this amendment to this ordinance tonight. Thank you. Council member Markley. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. I thought I was already muted, but I'm not. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to council members uh, Rodenberg and Franich. I, um, this is a really hard decision, no matter what way you look at it. It's hard for both groups of people, the people who want to still do this for five days and the people who don't want to do it at all and the people that want to do it on one day. It, it is um, impossible to know what all almost 12,000 citizens of Gig Harbor would say about this. So that's why I supported the compromise because I thought it was a good idea to give that a chance. And um, I'm sorry that that didn't pass, Councilmember Franich, but um, in light of all the comments that have been received and comments that I've received from neighbors as we've talked about this, you know, that didn't write in, the overwhelming consensus is that they do want this on one day. And so I am gonna support this ordinance. I did want to give that, um, that uh, compromise a chance though, but I will be supporting this because I don't want to deny the issues that our citizens have brought to our attention and I, and I agree with them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I believe council member Franich was, was next. Um, is uh, well, okay. Go ahead, Councilmember Franich. Doesn't always yes. put it in the right queue. Okay. Um, well, you know, I I also believe in quiet enjoyment of of uh, people's right to quiet enjoyment, and you know, the people that live in the Millville area, in the downtown core, you can you can ask Miss Olivier about her quiet enjoyment when <laughs> restaurants went in in Millville. The, the residents of Millville are gonna be severely impacted by the Ansich Park. So I, I just hope that um, the council members that feel that quiet enjoyment is a paramount <coughs> thing for citizens and for them to take into consideration, I hope that carries forward onto more than just this issue. 
And as far as um, uh, Council Member uh, Markley's um, comments, I respect them and I, I feel the same way she does, but I also would encourage that people that, that live in Gig Harbor North in some of these in Harbor Crossing or any of the developments that are up there, they can also address some of these things through their homeowner association. And maybe that's something that they should, should take a look at there as well. So thank you all very much. Council Member Wook, and I hope you're going to call the question, but uh, Council Member Wook. <laughs> yes, I am going to call the question. Okay. Okay, there's a motion to stop second. debate. Is there a second? Second. Great. There's a second to stop debate. It's the uh, old business number one. And uh, go on to uh, the motion. Uh, all those in favor of stopping debate. And I know Council Member Rodenberg's hand was raised. So the way we're doing it is uh, if you want more people to talk, then you then you kill this motion. Otherwise, we're not going on even though people have raised their hands. That's what we decided before. So can, all those in favor of stopping debate and going straight to the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Even though I seconded the motion, I didn't realize Council Member Rodenberg had his hand up. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to vote against my second. That's okay. It's um, we've we've said this before. If if people don't want to uh keep going, then they then they vote. Okay. Uh, I'm willing to lower my hand. Yeah. Um, I think everyone. Okay. All those uh, not in favor, say aye. Abstained. Okay. We're going to stop debate. We're going to go straight to the motion. The motion is to adopt ordinance fourteen sixty as presented. Uh. I'll do a, a, a call. All those in favor say aye, starting with uh, Wook. Aye. Okay, uh, Dinson. Aye. Uh, Council Member Rodenberg. Sorry, Council Member Dinson. Uh, Council Member Rodenberg. I, yeah, I should have said Council Member Dinson, sorry. <laughs> do you want my vote or? Yes. Yeah, I'm representing the 11,000 other people that did not, did not get specific emails asking their opinion, so I vote no. Council Member Franich? Aye. Council Member Himes? Aye. Council Member Markley? Aye. Council Member Aversold? Aye. Okay, motion passes six to one. Um, I, I would like uh, <clears throat> Josh and Molly, and Laura's not here anymore, but Josh, Molly, maybe a hair with Paul and Kelly. I think a lot of this we've heard tonight is education. So we, for this to really take effect um, and not just be a bigger explosion on one day, I'd like staff to try to gather a way of public outreach. Um, and it's not just about the fine, but it's about the, the side effects that people aren't necessarily realizing. And if um, council even wants to give some things to to staff that they can put. We'll get something for Laura. We'll get something in the paper. And um, let's see, Chase, <coughs> the gateway is still listening. So thank you. So we'll get something in the gateway that educates about, um, about uh, awareness of the, of the other things around us. Yes, Kelly. So it might be a good just to remind the public this would not take effect till 2022. That's true. All right, well then right after this year, let's not do it before July. Well, it never hurts. So we can just tell them what we passed, but let's get education next year. So that'd be great. Okay, and I thought, Paul, did you have, or no, I'm sorry, Katrina, you had your hand raised? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chief Busey said it already, just to, yeah. wanted to let the public know that it would not go into effect this year. And Thanks. we'll make sure that we provide that education. I knew that, but then I got overzealous, you know. <laughs> okay, on to new business number one. Woohoo. Uh, regional <laughs> decamp facility beneficial use agreement, Port Orchard interlocal agreement. And you will hear from, I believe, uh, Jeff, are you taking this? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, Council. 
Uh, so as you saw in the council bill, the, the city hauls vector waste uh, from the city of Gig Harbor to PRS Group in Tacoma. PRS Group is an environmental waste management company. Um, they're located on the High Lavos Waterway. And so in order for the city to provide or deliver our vector waste to PRS Group, we have to make the lengthy travel to the High Lavos Waterway. Uh, those disposal costs um, are fairly high, and uh, we also have to pay bridge tolls to, to, to get there. So what the city is looking to do is, at some point in the future, create a decant facility on the city's new operations shop site. Uh, but first, we have to install the sewer grinder pump at that site, which will come with the construction of the building. So in the meantime... Um, the city is looking to take Bacter Waste uh, to a closer and less expensive facility. And that one that uh, our staff has found is the city of Port Orchard's facility. So this interlocal agreement would, would provide us with that ability to take our Bacter Waste to the city of Port Orchard. Uh, we do anticipate this agreement will save the city money due to the reduced travel times, reduced disposal costs, and not having to pay bridge tolls. So that's what the ILA is about. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Now, um, when we, I believe it said until either party wants to uh, terminate this, which means when we get our facility, we can just terminate it, correct? Right. Okay, great. Uh, Council Member Hines. Uh, yeah, uh, I just had a question. Somewhere in here I read it was, it was $200 per dump, I guess was what I would call it. And it begs the question, how many trips do we anticipate? Or is there a historical average that we maintain? Um, I don't have the exact number or, or, or the average, but it's um, throughout a year, it's, it's well north of 100 trips. Okay. And this year, just this year alone, we are anticipating to spend $50,000 in okay. to take our Bacter Waste to PRS and Tacoma for the uh, travel time and the and the dump fees and the bridge tolls. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Aversol. Yeah, uh, Mr. Langham, I seem to remember a couple of years ago. I think we had a conversation about maybe purchasing a new Vector truck or getting a replacement for an older Vector truck. And I think we had this conversation about where we dump this stuff. Is are we so are we still utilizing same place that we talked about? in the past or is this a new thing help me remember please. sure I, so as far as the vector truck goes yes we purchased the new vector truck at the beginning of this year uh and so that helps because we have a more reliable vehicle now uh but what you may recall is in, in your time on the council we have not had our own um place to decant the vector waste and so we have been for the past at least four years been taking factory waste into PRS and Tacoma. So that has remained consistent. Council member Franich. Yeah, Jeff, you know, we got the small load, medium load, large load costs or what are we paying now for rates? Well, it depends on it. We pay by the ton. Um, and so, uh, that and, and that includes all of the water weight um, right so i i mean i'm just looking at page 17 of 17 yeah. that has the uh charges on it i'm just wondering how those compare to what we're paying right now yeah and so um we we were paying we're paying about twice that uh that was about um a year and a half ago, we were paying about maybe two years ago, we were paying twice this. We started to talk about this as part of the uh, budget discussion, I think two years ago. And so we were, we were paying about twice that. Okay, I think it's a great idea. Like to see us uh, doing all we can to use our taxpayers' money as widely as we can. Great. Um, okay, we will open up the public comments. Um, uh, Bob, are there any written comments on this? Uh, Mayor, no, I have not received any written comments on this item. Okay. I will open it up for people that are listening in. Uh, any public comments on this? Raise your hand. 
Okay, I don't see anyone raise their hand. I'm closing the public comment. Uh, Council Member Wu. Yes. Um, uh, Mr. Langham, thank you very much for finding us a spot that gets the job done and saves our citizens some money. So I, um, I make a motion to authorize the mayor or his designee to allow public works to utilize City of Port Orchard's decant facility for stormwater vacuum educator truck waste. Council Member Himes. He's second and, and, and silent as I've heard the silent second. second. <laughs> okay. Okay, there's a motion, there's a second. Can I ask you a clarifying question? Yes. And, and, and that's to authorize the mayor to enter it into the interlocal agreement through that, correct? <clears throat> oh. Yeah, correct, Council Member Wook? Yes, I was just reading the proposed council action. Yeah, and, and it's not, the, 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 the action, is not properly spelled out. It should be to enter into a local interlocal agreement. The the recommended motion on the bottom of the page is slightly different, and and so I just wanted to make sure. Uh, so, would you like me to make this again? Yeah, uh, if you'd like to read the one at the bottom of the page, that would. Uh, uh, yes. Sure. So so yes, I rec so I move to authorize the mayor or his designee to sign an interlocutory. A regional decant facility beneficial use agreement between City of Gig Harbor and the City of Port Orchard. Second. Council Member Heim, second. <clears throat> I don't see any hands raised. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Abstained? Draw a line through the yeses. Okay. On to new business number two. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We have Austin Honorary Art, Austin Services Contract Amendment Number Two, uh, uh, Public Works Director Jeff Langhill. Uh, yes. Um, so as we all know, the city's been working with uh, the, an artist to allow for the continued storage of the city's um, honoring art that will be one day placed, hopefully, at Austin Park. Uh, this storage has been extended due to the timelines associated with uh, submitting the required permits that the Public Works hasn't done yet. Um, the city is looking to amend this contract with this amendment number two. The amendment number two will do the following two items. One, it will extend the duration of the contract to the end of 2021 to accommodate for the installation of the art and Two, it will pay the artist for his storage and ensuring of the art while it was at his shop. And so um, as before we, before I hand this off completely, I would like to share a picture I received earlier this week of the art. This, uh, hopefully you all can see it now. This is the artwork on the city's trailer located at the city shop when it was pulled in earlier this week to the city shop. Uh, we took possession of the, of the art and are now storing it um, until such time the permitting is complete and the art base is constructed. Um, we do anticipate based on the timeline for the SMP amendment and the uh, land use applications and building applications and construction that we will be uh, able to have this piece of art installed in late summer or early fall. That's what we have tonight. Any questions? Okay, uh, great. Um, Council Member Granich. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, did we, um, how did you determine there was some extra insurance that Mr. Copeland was paying? Because his original insurance uh, term only required by the original contract required him to hold insurance on the art until uh, I think it was July of 2020. 2020. And so um, it, when we discussed with Mr. Coleman, um, <clears throat> originally that it if you could hold it for us until we got into March of 2021, 
um, we agreed and acknowledged and he provided us with the insurance certificate since it had um, not yet expired. He just allowed it to be maintained, but he had to renew it in the middle of that time frame. So we wanted to be able to pay him both for keeping it safe and secured and taking up room in his shop and then pay for the additional insurance. Okay, so you did verify that there was some extra cost for the insurance? That's a yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. I don't see any uh, hands raised. We'll open it up to uh, public comment. Uh, Bob, was there any public comment that was written? Uh, no, I've not received any written comments on this item, Mayor. Okay. Any callers wish to um, uh, raise their hand for public comment? Okay. I'll close the public comment. Uh, Council Member Dinson. Yes, I move to approve and authorize the mayor to execute amendment number two to the artist service services contract with Guy Kappelman for the Austin Honoring Art. Second. There's a second. I don't see any other uh, hands raised for deliberation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion passes. We will go on to new business item three, which is Edinburgh, Edinburgh Brick House Professional Service Contract Amendment number six with SHKS. Uh, Thank you for being there with us. Uh, Public Works Director, Jeff Langhill. We got them all tonight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the work identified as part of the proposed amendment uh, provides for the preparation and uh, review of construction documents between the city and the contractor. This total, as you see, is not expected to exceed to $4,760. This is the same scope that was presented at the April 12th council meeting, less the $500 structural investigation that was approved as part of the April 12th meeting. Uh, right after the April 12th meeting, the consultants uh, completed their structural review and uh, found that we don't have to replace the entire chimney column. Uh, it looks like that we'll only be needing to provide structural support from essentially right around the roof line up to the top of the chimney. So that's what this uh, was initially anticipated as part of the April 12th or original scope. And so the consultant is just looking for the uh, approval to proceed with the final steps in that original scope and that totals $4,760. Um, once the chimney uh, repair design is completed by the consultant. Uh, we will request a price from the contractor to uh, do the work. And then based on that response, we will either have the authority to sign that at the city engineer or public works director level, or we may have to come back to city council for authorization. Um, I wanna make sure that council is very aware that not doing the chimney repair could cause the structure to come to, to be removed uh, off of the historic registry list. Uh, and then if removed from the historic registry list, uh, the boat shop may be required to return the State Historic Society grant at, that they received to do the work on the building. I think that was in the neighborhood of uh, 70 or $80,000. Uh, public Works and Community Development both support the chimney replacement as proposed in order to maintain its uh, listing and historical character. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And then we, even though we don't know for sure until the bids come in, we're thinking it's around twelve to $15,000 or so. Is that correct? That's correct. The, the, the uh, contractor originally estimated that uh, without having the structural report, they thought it was in that range. Right. Um, have we checked that other chimney just so we know what? Okay. We have, and it's it's fine. We don't need to do anything to that one. Okay. Uh, Council member Franich. Well, you know, this is, uh, this is the height of um, just complete out of control government. I, this is this is a poster child for this. Um, I understand 
and I respect the need to follow historic register guidelines. And, you know, I went back and I listened to the DRB tape and in the memorandum, there was a memorandum that, was, that, that came from the city and there were three options on that memorandum. One was do nothing. One was to rebuild it with the existing material and one was to um, go back up with, with uh, a light kind. And I, I understand, I had a discussion with Ms. Knudsen about this. And, you know, you, you look at the Secretary of Interior's guidelines and it's not you shall replace it with the exact same material, it's you should. So, um, you know, I, I'm not going to make a big deal out of this. We're, we're spending money like drunken sailors on a daily basis. Uh, you know, what's another 17,000, you know, so, but the one thing that I don't know if Katrina is still, well, there she is. So the only thing that, that I want to make sure that, that, that comes out of this is I want some assurances that there will be no further district as it, and I won't bring up all the stuff that I brought up at the last meeting about places where I believe that the um, Secretary of Interior standards were not followed. So I just want to I, I just want to get on the record with some assurances that there will be no no further disregard for the provisions that are spelled out by the uh, Secretary of the Interior and that we are going to remedy existing deficiencies from those standards that may exist right now. So I would just like to, to have uh, Mr. Langhelm and Ms. Knudsen comment on those two issues. Thank you, Council Member Frenich. I really appreciate our conversation last week and I want to let you know that um, Director Langhelm and I have had conversations and we have a plan moving forward for when the city um, is considering amendments to its historic properties. I believe that we are better in lockstep now, our departments, and there's a better understanding of how to approach um, all of these. And as we discussed, if there were things done in the past, um, you know, we can work to rectify those, but we don't want to base uh, future decisions on previous um, bad decisions. No, but I, I just want to make sure that, that since this is come up as such a big issue to, to rise to the level of $17,000 that we are going to go back and we're going to remedy any potentially existing um, deviations from the standards that are spelled out in the Department of Interior, which has to do with not only the structure, but the grounds. That's correct. We will go back and look at those council member branch as we talked about. All right, very good, thank you. Uh, council member Hines. Uh, yes, I, I support uh, council member Frank and his comments. I, I noticed in the uh, presentation tonight from Sharon Bishop and Monica Bellis that she was coming in over the water with the video shot looking down on that building. And all I can say is it looked completely authentic to me. And that was the best view you could ever have looking down on the building, okay, as you flew over it in the location where that chimney is. Uh, so I, I share council member French's frustration call we just got the best view of it you could ever get, okay, as far as authenticating a chimney on top of that building. And uh, I don't think anybody even noticed it. Anyway, enough said. Thank you. Council Mayor Abersole. Yeah, I think that this is uh, a cosmetic uh, fix and uh, normally wouldn't be voting for it. But uh, with what was said about losing the historical registry and that that could potentially cause the boat shop to have to reimburse the state for seven or eighty thousand dollars, I think spending uh, twelve to seventeen thousand dollars is probably a pretty good idea because if we don't, the boat shop would then just come back to us a couple years later down the road and said, 
we had to give up $80,000 because of your decision. So we'd like you to reimburse us for that $80,000, which we will probably end up having to do down the road. So I think this just saves us money, even though we have to spend. You want to do a motion with that? I'm sorry? You want to do a motion with that? Uh, and I so don't point have of order, to... point of order. I don't think we've had public comment yet. You're right. You. I'm sorry about that. You can still have a motion without public comment, though. We've most of our most of our public comments have come after the motion's been made. A lot of times, it can come before or after. It it has Councilmember Rodenberg. We've done it both ways. Let's ask uh, our attorney. We've done it for. I've been here three and a half years. Councilmember Rodenberg, there's been, we've had motions before and after. Go ahead and ask him. It, it, it should come after, in my opinion. What should come after, the motion or the public comment? A absolutely. The, I, I know we've had this discussion before about motions getting made before public comment, and I don't see how it's, especially in light of all the deference we gave to the public comment on the fireworks issue, I mean, people's minds shouldn't be made up to make a motion until after we hear from the public. Daniel, can you make can you make a comment, Daniel? I, I'm not going to get in the middle of that. I'll just point to the agenda. The agenda has public comment and then council deliberation and action. So I'll just leave okay. it to that. Okay, fine. We'll open up the public comment. Um, uh, is there any public comment on this, uh, Bob? I have not received any written comments on this item, Mayor. Um, we, we, we have opened up the public comment. Anyone from the public that's called in uh, would like to speak, please raise your hand. Okay, we'll close the public comment. Um, I'll, I'll wait, I'm not gonna suggest anything, you know, so. <laughs> Council member Whoop. <laughs> yes, thank you. So this is property that was purchased by the citizens of Gig Harbor. And, uh, and this is a wonderful historic building. So I think, um, I think saving and honoring our historic downtown is very important. And it's also very important that we do not put at risk the $70,000 that was this that the city has used to work on this property. So in the interest of uh, of good fiscal management and also listening to our citizens who have uh, contributed financially to this pro property. I um, would make a motion to approve and authorize the mayor to execute amendment number six to the professional services contract with SHKS Architects in the amount not to exceed $4,760. I'd second that. Okay. Is there any more deliberation? Uh, are you, uh, do you have another comment, Council Member Whoop? Your hand is still raised. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, I heard three ayes. Uh, all those opposed? Abstain? Okay, let's do a roll call because I heard three ayes. So um, all those in favor say aye, Council Member Whoop. Aye. Council Member Dinson. Aye. Council Member Rodenberg. Aye. Council Member Franich. Aye. Council Member Himes. Bowing to extortion, aye. Council Member Markley. Aye. Council Member Aversol. Aye. Okay, motion passes 7-0. Okay, council reports and comments. We have our public works committee uh, was April 13th. Council member Franich. Uh-huh. Uh, if you want to go into the announcement of other meetings, I have misplaced my agenda for that. So just give me one second. You can go on to the rest of the Okay. Uh, other I'm sure there's other council comments. Council member Rodenberg. Yeah, I, I did have a, a comment. Uh, I every couple of weeks when uh, City Administrator Arson sends out his uh, documents on what each department is doing, uh, I really appreciate that, and it's good to see what all the different departments are doing. 
but I was really surprised that the one department that doesn't seem to be uh, doing what I would expect it to do only had one sentence. Everybody, every other department had five paragraphs, but human resources had one sentence and it said, we're working on uh, hiring people. What we've had, there's more than 22 positions we need to get filled and some have been posted for, for months. Uh, Councilman Himes asked for additional people in public works. And I'm specifically interested in uh, the parks manager because we've asked our public works director to take over not only public works, but now parks managing. And I think that's an overwhelming one. Each of those jobs are overwhelming given the short staff. So I'd like to see some emphasis put on hiring some people instead of just uh, interviewing them and let it stop. I was very impressed with the Peninsula School District uh, who offered uh, their administrator a job after two weeks after they did all the interviews, the guy got the job. So I, I, I'm very interested, what's the holdup? Why can't we hire the people that we've posted for when we're interviewing people? I understand there's two people that have had interviews for the uh, parks manager job, but yet we still haven't hired anyone. So I think that's a big concern and we all should be uh, interested in. Is there any answers out there? I think Thursday we can give you more answers because we will be talking with HR at our meeting, at our work study session. And I'm not trying to put you off, but part of the, part of going into the depth of of our first uh, but quarter of our budget is is personnel and is talking about that. So I think that would be a great time to um, uh, be able to talk more about it then. Uh, Bob? I look forward you, to that. Okay. Would you agree, Bob, or do you have anything to add to that? No, this wouldn't be the, uh, the appropriate time to discuss that. We can certainly discuss it on Thursday. Okay. Um, okay, it, I understand your concern, Councilmember Rodenberg. I, I really do, and obviously here every day I'm very frustrated too, and so um, we'll be able to comment more on that on Thursday. But I, you have every right to bring that up. Uh, Councilmember um, Himes. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, yeah. so I would just uh, concur with Councilmember Rodenberg, uh, and again, I, I We'll talk about it Thursday, but looking at the individual department write-ups for the Thursday gathering, um, it just dawned on me, a third of the year is gone. And you look at what we've still got on the table and uh, it starts getting really scary, to be quite honest. Called Now you, we, we've burned up a third of the year and everything else that we said we we're going to do in 2021, a lot of it, almost all of it's still out there. Okay. So again, the hiring thing uh, just emphasizes that, that, that situation, but I will wait for, for the discussion Thursday, but I just wanted to put that out there because I thought that was something that really uh, jumped out and grabbed you at, in the report that you provided on the budget called, Oh my gosh, how, how are we going to pull this thing off? And I think that's an excellent question. How are we going to pull this off? Right. Well, the first thing, uh, not to enlighten, but we're not. We're not going to be able to pull them all off. And I've expressed that with a little bit of council members. It's not. It's very hard to get everything done when you're in the middle of a pandemic and you're closed. And so we will. You know, we, there's there's no way to do the same amount as when you're not open. So we will. We will include you in trying to figure it out on Thursday. So, uh, Council Member uh, Council Member Franich, are you you want to go back to your report? Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, we met on we met on Tuesday, April thirteenth. Um, we had three items of business. We discussed the uh, Murphy's Landing Marina Navigation Channel dredging. Um, that is mainly the hold up there. It's got to go through the process with the state to get the permit. Um, we 
had a discussion about uh, the pavement rating system. Thought that was a very interesting discussion, uh, very informative on all the streets are rated, um, the pavements rated every, uh, every other year, every year. And um, so hopefully maybe we all kind of had some, some of the numbers didn't seem to quite add up. So um, we had a discussion about that. Uh, it's going to be no action that anybody needs to worry about on that. And I thought that the, the most important thing we discussed was uh, water franchise agreements. We have a handful of private water systems that um, provide water to not a large portion of our city residents, but there's a fair amount of private water systems that provide water to different neighborhoods. And um, it was suggested that we move forward with a franchise agreement since we don't have any franchise agreements in place with any of these providers. Um, Washington Water being the biggest. So I thought that it was very important and, and I believe that at least uh, if not the majority of the committee members felt that we needed to reach out not just to Washington Water but to the smaller uh, water providers to let them know that we are going to be moving down the path of a franchise agreement and um, that could have some financial impacts on them. So, um, and those were the three things that we discussed. I, I don't know if council member Himes would have anything to add or if any of the other council member any questions, but I can answer them. I think you nailed it. Yeah, you did a good job. Great. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, council Member Wu. Yes, so now that we're back to council comments, uh, the document that we didn't discuss very much tonight was the first quarter finance, finance status report. And um, this is a really good document. I, um, it provides more transparency for our citizens and any time that we can provide transparency to our citizens, it's a good thing. Um, so I look forward to this conversation on Monday I mean, on Thursday evening, and I want to say a special thank you for the folks who worked so hard to put this document together. Assistant City Clerk Josh Decker, Public Works Director Jeff Langham, Public um, Community Development Director Katrina Knudsen, and all your teams to the finance team, to everybody who worked so hard to put this uh, document together. If our citizens would like to look at the projects that the city is working on, you will see every project that's listed in the budget in this report, and you will be able to see if the projects are on track for being completed in 2021. You can see the percentage that they're on track of being done or not being done. So it's just a really good document for transparency if any of our citizens have questions along those lines. And I'm especially grateful to see that um, the Gig Harbor North pedestrian crossing lights are still there. So thanks everybody for doing this great job. Thank you, Council Member Wu. Uh, Council Member Franich. Yes, well, you know, I appreciate the council supporting the, the proclamation that the mayor read earlier this evening. Um, I had a little bit more targeted uh, audience in mind for that. Um, I know that uh, there was uh, quite a few and council member who reached out to me and I believe that there were some other council members that, that reached out. I, I personally wanted to uh, show a little bit of extra appreciation for the uh, retail workers. Kind of got hijacked into this essential worker scenario. Um, the people that work in our retail sectors uh, and don't get me wrong, I appreciate and I, I recognize the fact that all the essential workers are, you know, they're potentially putting themselves in harm's way, but the retail workers are some of the lowest paid people in the essential workers category. So that is why I really wanted to, to keep it to that. Um, I appreciate everybody else's comments, but I just wanted to take time under council comments to um, at least uh, express where my my uh, initial intent was with that. And uh, so thank you. 
Thank you. Councilmember Aversol. Yeah, I just wanted to recognize uh, the Peninsula High School Key Club who hosted a pancake drive uh, this weekend at the Harbor Covenant Church. I want to thank Harbor Covenant Church for allowing our students to utilize their facility. Uh, our students, uh, Peninsula High School Key Club, were able to raise over either 600 pounds or 600 boxes of pancake mix uh, for people. And I just think that that's an amazing job. Uh, four students sat out for about eight hours. Um, you know, and it was sunny, but it was kind of cold, a little windy. Uh, and I just think that's really amazing that these students are uh, out there doing this uh, in COVID. And I just want to recognize their efforts and say what a great job they did. But we're very proud. I'm very proud of them. I think we should all be proud. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Council. And we've got announcements of other meetings. It's the Planning and Building Committee, uh, Monday, May 3rd at 3 p.m. Uh, we have the Parks Commission, Wednesday, May 5th um, at 5.30 p.m. And we had just discussed, we have um, a Council Study Session at 3 o'clock uh, this coming Friday, I'm sorry, this Thursday, the 29th, at 3 p.m. Um, did you have a did you have another did you have a comment, Council Member Rodenberg? Yeah, I was just gonna say something. I decided not to, but now since you asked me, I think I will. Sure. Uh, I appreciate the proclamation that you made, and I appreciate Councilman Franich's uh, specificity on retail clerks. But the concern I have is that there's so many others that have put their health at risk serving the public, and we're not pro proclaiming our thanks for them. Uh, it's a tough situation. The more you thank some very deserving groups, the more emphasis there is on the individuals or groups that have been excluded. And many have done just as much. But on the other hand, if proclamations are made for every deserving group, in my opinion, it diminishes the importance of our appreciation in general. We should be thankful and appreciate the fact that we live in a community that has so many individuals and groups that are making sure their friends, their neighbors, and even strangers have all the essential needs they have. So uh, I appreciate uh, the mayor expanding on Councilman Franich's uh, uh, idea, but retail clerks are among the very best. I give you that. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you all very much. And Move to Council adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Have a good evening, everyone. See you on Thursday or, yeah. Bye.